Uh, Use your, your outside voice. <laughs> <laughs> you so, can do it. We have full faith. So um, I'm calling this meeting to order. It's uh, five, two minutes past five. And uh, please make sure your cell phone turn, uh, turned off. And um, any extraneous conversations, please take them outside. And if you're recording this, please let us know. And um, for those who want to come up and s address the uh, commission, please use the microphones uh, so that it can be recorded. And please use your outdoor voice, as Jeff said, because otherwise people won't hear you. And I'd like to welcome Mark Beale to the commission. Thank you. Welcome aboard, Mark. And the meetings um, aren't always this full. I'll just tell you that now. Right. So we. Um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we we right. have um, two items on the agenda that have been continued, both certificates of compliance. Uh, In RDA? Sorry? And the RDA. RDA also. And where's the RDA? Oh, on the private page. On the. Yeah. Huh, I didn't know that that had been continued. Sorry. So. Um, Mid Island Service Limited Partnership is at 4143 Sparks Avenue, is continued until what, February the 5th? February the 5th. Okay. Yes, sir. And Hardeman, 51B Madicott Road, continued to February 19th. And Madicott Wheelhouse LLC, 13 Mass Ave, continued to February the 5th. Uh, is there anyone who can't make those meetings who would like to address the commission? And um, is there anyone who would like to um, address the commission on items that aren't on this evening's agenda? I have something. You do? Yes. Fire away. So this really isn't public comment. This is just kind of a reminder to the room that if you're going to come up to present, obviously, Ian said, come up and speak into the microphones. Uh, our most common complaint is that people can't be heard on the recordings, that people um, <coughs> like to watch at home and then secondly we also ask for people if you're going to come up and give comment we want you to come and participate try not to repeat what other people have already said and then also try to keep any information that you present centered around the interests of the wetlands protection act and our local bylaw because that's kind of the limits of the jurisdiction so if comments can stay focused to that that will hopefully have us have a, a quick and efficient meeting and we can get through everything speedily Hope Springs of Tunnel. Okay. <laughs> so, notice of intent. Uh, the first one is Truck Row Nominee Trust, 25 Quays Road. Thank you for the applicant, Arthur Gasparo, Nantucket Engineering. I'm before you tonight uh, with the notice of intent application for the installation of um, a new steel bulkhead in front of an existing failing timber bulkhead. And as you can see uh, on the plan in front of you shown in red is the <clears throat> location of the uh, proposed steel bulkhead, um, which would run in front of directly in front of the existing bulkhead. Um, we would install it uh, as close as possible and then along the easterly property line, we're proposing a return uh, back along the, the property line uh, where there's starting to be some, some flanking that's happening of the existing structure and undermining that to uh, try to prevent uh, further destabilization in that area. The um, uh, project before you believe does not require a waiver on the basis of uh, water dependent use. We have uh, provided a revised plan from the original submission, which is what's before you. And the only change is that we moved the construction access from the east side of the house to the west side of the house based on meetings that I've had um, uh, with the contractor, Toscana, at the site to discuss uh, how we could minimize impact. Uh, if we were to go to the original proposed location, we were going to have to build a bit of a stabilized haul road 
uh, across the um, uh, across the lawn area. So we have a shorter distance to, to do that where we would have to stabilize and then simply restore uh, that area. Both are already essentially clear of vegetation or, or very, very small vegetation. And we would restore any upland disturbed areas to uh, in-kind conditions. So if we have to put down uh, some hardener uh, and base mix for the machinery, then we would remove that and restore it with um, clean topsoil and, and seed or plants to match existing conditions. We have explored alternatives, understanding the meet the um, performance standards of the of the commission in terms of um, what else we could perhaps do in this location. And uh, we considered that if we were to try to rebuild the the timber bulkhead, and remove it there would be a greater level of disturbance of the bank there are dead men throughout along this area that tie back um, that would all have to have to be either removed or, or, or cut to reinstall a timber bulkhead would would require um, more more excavation of that area as well and um, while the steel sheeting is a, um, a, a more expensive um, way to go about it. We believe that it's it's preferable in terms of meeting the uh, protected interests, limiting disturbance. We have looked at whether or not um, the work, you know, how the work would be done, which I'd like to briefly go over. I think it's important on the, this location, especially. Um, I don't think that we could work down on the beach. I didn't want to request that. So what we've proposed, there's a bit of a plateaued area across the um, the, the top of the bulkhead. And um, we would create a small ramp. The, um, the, the bank, as you can see from the, the spot elevations that are shown, it's only about uh, six feet high. And then we, that would get us down to, to this area. And again, having met with the contractor, they'd be able to get their uh, smaller track excavator down there and to work from that position in order to drive the steel sheeting. The sheeting would be installed with a vibratory head uh, so again, we wouldn't have um, any any work proposed down on the beach itself. The sheeting would be your typical corrugated style, where you know it's got the um, uh, it's not a smooth surface. Again, um, for both reasons of strength as well as to um, uh, help to to break wave energy, not refracting off of a, a completely smooth surface, and. Um, Again, we would we would propose that a cap we, we would use flowable fill to go in the gap between the steel sheeting and the timber bulkhead, and then we would install um, a combination of a concrete or timber cap that would uh, hold the two structures together, which is essentially and it would tie into the existing bulkhead that's on the land bank property immediately adjacent, same style as as what was approved at, at that location um, to to match along there. The um, uh, again, any areas of the of the bank and the work area uh, that are disturbed would be planted with uh, with American beach grass, and pretty much the the flatter area across uh, the top of the is um, the the bank. You know, we we're not proposing to come in with um, an extensive amount of fill. We just would try to restore a, a you know a bit of a uniform slope. Uh, through the area to only to the extent necessary and um, and, and then use temporary uh, irrigation for getting the plantings um, established um, and with that I'd be happy to uh, address questions or concerns that you may have with the application the flow of fill is just sand and water it's and cement forward. without aggregate okay thank you so I um, entered into the record three technical do guidance documents about using living shorelines in place of bulkhead repair or bulkhead essentially is being rebuilt. Um, our performance standards for Coastal Beach and Coastal Bank say that bulkheads can't be rebuilt if there's an environmentally more friendly solution that could be explored. So I entered three guidance documents one from Galveston Bay, one from Chesapeake Bay, and one from Seattle that detail a whole range of alternatives to bulkheads, including hybrid projects where uh, bulkheads are still included but with additional features. Also, revegetation. There's a whole list of projects in these documents which are in the record, as well as a popular news article 
and a peer review um, published article that talk about how ecologically friendly solutions have been used successfully in place of bulkhead repair and how in many cases they're also economically more beneficial. So I would implore the applicant to look through these documents and consider using a living shoreline technique in place of a bulkhead being rebuilt since our performance standards for Coastal Beach and Coastal Bank say that that needs to be addressed before we can go forward with a, a new bulkhead. I understand that it's just kind of an in-kind repair and historically we've, the commission has allowed that in the past, but our standards do say that those ecologically more friendly techniques need to be considered. So I'd like to see that done, please. May I respond? Oh, of course. So um, I thank you for providing the information. I did just see it last night and started looking through it and I will respond more fully, but to just qu quickly hit on it in terms of um, the application at this site, I think there's a couple of things that, that would have to be considered. Um, the doc, much of the creation of the living shoreline would, would involve some level of fill, um, often in, into, onto the beach and into the water body to try to ra raise the grade. Uh, I would have questions or concerns with how that fill would be stabilized. Two properties over about probably a dozen years ago, we tried to create a little salt marsh as part of um, uh, permitting at 29 Quays Road. And um, it wasn't very successful. And I'm not saying that there aren't a multitude of reasons for that. Um, but how we would hold that fill in place without the ability of, of having groins or even additional structure, as well as the licensing that would be required in order to, to fill that area. Um, the, the alternative to try to do what's been proposed in um, some of those situations we would have to cut this bank back quite a bit and we have a structure that's um, not too far back from the top of the bank which is also a pre-78 there's, there's several pre-78 structures on this property um, that have not been substantially approved so so there, there's that aspect of of um, qualifying for protection and i would be very concerned that any cutting back on this bank would there therefore endanger those structures so in, in weighing the alternatives um, you know, th that would be one of my major concerns of, 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 of being able to fill and alter resource areas. So while we have one performance standard that says um, that we have to examine other en environmentally um, uh, positive alternatives, we also have standards that we can't transfer one resource area to another. And I think that if we were to try to come in with what is being proposed or, or possibly proposed, suggested for certain sites, I think it's, it's applicable. But in this site, you essentially would be coming in and removing the coastal bank to come back because we can't go seaward at all. The, anything that you were to try to go seaward at this location um, without, without substantial groins to stabilize that fill material, the littoral drift along there is gonna remove that. Um, but I will further explore it. But I wanted to let you know that I had read I had read some of the materials and had also considered in my discussions um, with several of these family members uh, what maybe we could we could really do here. What I also didn't mention um, with respect to one of the reasons we came to the uh, conclusion that the most reasonable alternative is the steel is that it's cantilevered, it's self-supporting. So we don't have the need for uh, tiebacks and other disturbance that would have to be installed with uh, some of the other solutions. One of the other um, alternatives that the family asked me to look into was vinyl sheeting, uh, which has a bit longer of a, a lifetime. And um, there's a couple of reasons that I don't think that would meet, just so that we can go through the alternatives analysis that I work through to get to, to the, what's been proposed. Uh, one is there's a typically smooth face, and so you, you'd have a greater level of refraction. And the other, the big one, is that the, it, it requires jetting typically to uh, install either that or significant excavation. So the, um, uh, the vinyl doesn't have the same rigidity to be, to be driven, and especially in a semi-rocky, we've got some glacial erratics in, in this area as well. Um, 
which led us back to the, the, the minimize the disturbance would be the um, would, would be the, the steel. Again, we're proposing it to be the same height. We're not trying to, to increase height, though they would like to. I'll tell you that. I didn't think that that would be something, again, from alternatives of coming in. I felt that that would probably be felt as the commission of more of expanded structure. There is certainly overtopping. You could see from where that plateau area do, does happen. Um, but at this point, they feel that they've had this bulkhead for you know, decades protecting the pre-78 um, structure and it's starting to rot out, it's starting to fa fail. And this is a significant, you know, in investment for the family to um, what I see is, is responsible maintenance for the failing structure. Yeah, I understand those concerns and I know that we need to take the site characteristics into account. And I understand that in the adjacent sites as well, there are existing bulkheads but i just i just would like to see these alternatives considered through a formal analysis there are many ways to achieve the same type of uh, protection in this environment that has probably mild to moderate wave action you know it talks through fringe march marshes hybrid projects with rock sills talks through moving bulk, well, that may not be possible in this area, but talks through moving bulkheads back and planting in front of it. Doesn't sound like that's gonna work here. Talks about possibly changing the shape of bulkheads to incorporate more of like a cove type uh, look to them. There's a there's a whole list of, of decision points and different types of living shoreline possibilities that could get looked through. And it may come back and m none of them may be feasible, but I, I know this information came in relatively late, but I would, I would like to see that analysis done. Understood. Uh, I mean, I like Seth, I like what you brought to the table. I really enjoyed that. And then I started looking at this site and I really had our time like, I don't think it works here, but I, we would love to keep this on our files and if we can adapt this at some of the site. I think that would be great. Um, but I think this project really is a hard time because I'm like, you're not in a walkable beach and trying to play in front of it, it's not going to really work. And then just bringing everything back to you'd be right up to the house, if not beyond the house. So I had a little bit of a hard time getting my head around this one. And we've been to the site or next door because of. Dave from Zudo. So we do know the site pretty well, and I, I just don't think it works in this location. So, so thank you for finding that information. So, um, my reservations <laughs> well, are um, in part this peninsula effect that we're seeing. Um, as we have more and more bulkheads um, appearing on our shores. And so um, I've handed out uh, two photographs, one from the aerials from 1975 that you can find on the um, NHA's website. And they show a continuous beach that is walkable along its entire length. And then you see the peninsular effect um, today, and then on a on a survey from um, 1991, which admittedly is a mortgage survey, so I don't know how accurate it is. It doesn't claim to be completely accurate. It would be it would appear that there's enough room to move the house back, and. Um, so I, I would ask your clients to consider that. And, and then I'd also like the commission to consider going forward that if we allow repairs to bulkheads that we insist on public access so that they don't interfere with people walking along the beach, which is part of our purview under, what is it, 2.02? recreation which includes uh, walking along beaches and such so 
Yeah, I just think that we're at a kind of critical point in, um, you know, we're going to be going through a regulatory update soon and trying to set a standard for the future and also being evident or being aware of things like sea level rise and having to continuously repair and replace bulkheads as coastal storms and erosion increase. And I, th I just personally think that in my own opinion, bulkheads are sort of an outdated technology and there are ways to get around um, protecting structures in a, in a way that's fiscally more responsible and ecologically more responsible. I understand that in some cases that needs to be part of the toolbox and in some cases that's the only thing you can do. But I, I, I don't feel comfortable saying that's the only thing we can do here without seeing an alternative. Okay, so at this point, um, any other comments or shall I ask members of the public if they'd care to comment? Anybody uh, like to add to this? Thank you, Ward. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, Lucy Dillon. I'm a property owner in Quays. I know the property very well. I'd like to point out that to the west there is a land bank access and parking lot, and to the right is a, another access that um, to the beach that's right near the rails property. Um, I'd also I'm not making any judgment pro or con on this pro project. But I would like to point out that the beach to the east in front of the rails property is probably the most pristine beach on the harbor. Um, this side of Cody, or away from Cody. Thank you. Thank you. RJ? Oh, TJ, sorry. No, I'm right, RJ. RJ. <laughs> No, I said RJ initially. You know. <laughs> you answered anything, right? That's right. RJ Turcott, Nantucket Land Council. Just like to point out the return on this project is significant. And since the timber doesn't extend that entire distance back, it's not technically grandfathered in the way the rest of the timber bulkhead is. And we think that it should be considered a separate structure. It's going to increase erosion on what was just described as one of the most pristine sections of beach in the harbor. So it's a significant piece and it doesn't fall under the same rules as that timber section. So it's not really a replacement. It's a new bulkhead section. So I just wanted to comment on the return there. Thank you. Thank you. I, have a, I realize I've got a question um, that I meant to ask earlier. The, there's an existing bulkhead on the land bank property. What kind of shape is that in? Do we know? And does that give us any information about this? Sure. I permitted that, I, I think, in 2004, maybe six, something around then it was installed. Um, and again, uh, very similar. There, I think it's been a, a previous failing timber bulkhead along that property. It's in pretty good shape. Um, it's not in need of repair. It's steel. Okay. Um, it is have, there is some rust, you know, um, along the wet dry zone typically where, but it's um, uh, it's stable, very stable. Okay. Would you like to continue, or? Yes, I certainly will work to provide additional information and um, uh, work out a, a little bit more alternatives analysis. Um, as well as address um, the comments for, for the land council and uh, look at that easterly side a little bit more. And, and possibly continue to it. the next uh, meeting of uh, the 5th, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is 46 Shimo Pond Road. 
Uh, You have to sit down. Yeah, yeah, sit, sitting down. Yeah. Sitting, working yeah. best, okay. Yeah. If you pick it up, it sometimes cuts out. Well, we all yeah. kinds of components. Yeah. I know I've tried to transcribe them. But we've got um, we've got a couple of boards so that people can see it. I, I don't know where to... That's fine, yeah? Mm -hmm. If it helpful art, you can use this like a I can share. Can you put it here facing out? What is that? By whatever works for well, I think we've all seen these. These are the same that are in our package, right? So I think this way members of the audience get to see it. Yeah. So most people can see that now. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Does that work for everybody? Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Dan Bailey. I'm a land use attorney with the firm of Pierce Atwood in Boston, and I'm representing the applicant which is Michael Bass, is trustee of 46 Shimo Pond Road Trust. Uh, you'll notice that the notice of intent was filed by Arthur Reed, uh, but uh, I'm now the attorney of record for this particular proceeding. Um, I'm just going to quickly take the lead. I know you're far more interested in the technical aspects than the legal aspects. Um, and you know, Art will give an explanation of the proposed project. And then we have Jack Vaccaro, who's a wetland scientist at Epsilon Associates, who will talk about the uh, wetlands delineation, uh, the resource areas, and how the project perf uh, complies with performance standards. But I want to take a minute right up front and do exactly what Jeff said not to do, which is talk about something that is not really on the table here, but I think it's an elephant in the room, and I just want to talk about it, and that's zoning. Um, you know, we've received a lot of feedback questioning, how can you do this project? How, how can you even file? Because the zoning bylaw prohibits new or extensions of docks and piers. And the answer to that is ultimately we will have to file for a special permit with the Zoning Board of Appeals. And your bylaw does in fact prohibit the uh, any new, with limited exceptions, but certainly in this area, it prohibits new docks and piers or any extension or alteration of, of docks and piers. But Massachusetts zoning law at Chapter 40A, Section 6 provides protections for grandfathered structures and uses like this. Those are stru structures and uses that pre-existed pre the adoption of that preclusion of docks and piers. And that statute says that pre-existing uses can be altered or extended, provided that the Zoning Board of Appeals makes a finding that the change is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. That's an issue that's going to be have to be taken up with the Zoning Board of Appeals. We will do that at some point. I'm not quite sure when. Um, quite frankly, we wanted to start here because we wanted to get feedback on the technical issues before we went into the ZBA. So um, hopefully that provide some context for um, what we're doing and you know uh, where we're going with this on the zoning. Um, and so I'd like to actually ask Art now to um, go ahead and, and give you an overview of the project. Thank you, Dan. So again, I'm the Gaspar and Nantucket Engineering. Uh, I prepared, prepared the plan of record, um, which is the one on the table before you. And, um, the one which the uh, graphic is, is based on. We're proposing to um, extend the alter and extend the existing pier uh, approximately 280 feet from where it currently um, is about the midpoint of the uh, existing structure. The overall length would be about 300 feet. 
we're keeping the structure as narrow as possible at three feet wide. It would be five feet above mean high water um, in compliance with uh, DEP guidance for, for design of docks and piers. Uh, Jack can get more into this, but one of the primary reasons for that is to prevent impacts of shading. The uh, pier would have railings on it given the, the height that it is. There's a detail which is included on the drawing. We would be installing um, one foot tapered timber piles that would be driven uh, and, and then the pier would be constructed from uh, from the barge. The, um, uh, we would also provide next to the existing pier a uh, set of stairs on both sides which would be for lateral access in compliance with chapter 91 standards. The uh, portion of the existing pier uh, would be removed there's about 290 square feet. There's a timber sort of facade wave break that we would be um, would be eliminating, uh, as well as the end sort of curved portion of that here. Uh, we've done um, extensive um, uh, investigations. Again, more for for Jack to describe, but I do want to let you know that in my aspect of designing the pier and determining the location. It was based upon uh, many, many studies and examining alternatives in such a way to uh, determine a location to um, uh, minimize it, any impacts from the installation. And um, at the very end of the pier, we have proposed uh, two timber pilings on the opposite side that can be used for, for outhaul. We try. We have designed the pier to reach um, uh, elevation minus two mean low water. That's the reason for the for the length of the pier in terms of um, how we got to this design length, and uh, it's not it wasn't, it wasn't just arbitrary. We're designed we're designed for uh, a boat which would have about a one and a half to two foot uh, draft. So again, we're not talking about um, uh, very very large vessels. Uh, it is shallow in this area, and if we used a shorter pier, uh, we would be further limited um, in terms of. The size of the vessel that, that, that could access this and so um, that's been the, um, the, the design objective was to get to that elevation and those are shown in blue uh, numbers on the plan. We've done a um, uh, hydrographic survey which was conducted by CR environmental uh, survey of this this entire area and at your site visit yesterday you saw that we also set uh, stakes for your viewing to hopefully uh, get a sense of where this where this is going, I can tell you that we were able to set the end stake in waders at low tide. So I mean, we are we have to go this far just to get to um, you know a, an elevation that we can have a, a boat of, of even limited size be able to tie up there at, at low tide. And with that, I believe that uh, essentially describes the project on the plan before you. And I would uh, turn it over to Jack. Thanks, Art. Um, so I'm Jack Vicaro. I work for Epsilon Associates, and Epsilon prepared the notice of intent that's before you this evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, first about a general description of the site, the resource areas involved, a um, bit more about the, uh, in the eelgrass surveys that were done by CR Environmental that helped inform the configuration of the dock. And um, ultimately, we'll, we'll talk uh, about the performance standards that apply to the various resource areas that are going to be affected. So just a quick description on the site. It, it is about a one and a quarter acre site. There's a, a single family home that's currently on, under construction at the site. Those of you who, who uh, visited the site with me yesterday are aware. And uh, on the property is also this existing uh, dock of um, uh, that arcs from the uh, from the shore near the north side of the property and terminates in the intertidal zone, not far beyond mean high water. In fact, um, the site has been uh, it, it faces the northwest. It's almost directly across the harbor from the entrance and uh, is subject to a northwest fetch. There's been over the years uh, some erosion at the site. CZM estimates the rate of erosion at the location of the proposed dock of about a half a foot per year. Um, there's four groins that were installed along the, the front at the waterfront. Um, those 
predate the chart that was published in 1953. I don't know exactly when they were built. Maybe some of the uh, uh, people in the audience tonight will have a better sense, but it, we know that they were there in 1953. And then more recently in uh, mid-1990s, uh, this timber bulkhead was built <coughs> on the base of the uh, coastal bank at the site. As far as uh, adjacent land uses, of course, this is a residential area, but directly south of the site is a landing area, property owned by the Shimo Association. Uh, it's used for parking of vehicles and access, um, launching of small boats, kayaks and rowboats and that sort of thing. Um, and there's, as far as other uses, waterborne uses in the area, there is a several boats, uh, small boats are moored in the shallows opposite 46. Shimo Pond Road, and there's also a, a dock that extends um, nearly 400 feet offshore from the property at 42 uh, Shimo Pond Road. Uh, that dock is about six feet wide and about 100 feet uh, beyond the Shimo Association property. For resource areas on the site, I'll start with the landward resource areas. We obviously have uh, land subject to coastal storm flowage uh, that extends. There's a V zone that extends up to the, uh, essentially up to the uh, timber bulkhead. And then beyond that, in the lower portion of the site to the south and encompassing a lot of the Shimo Association land is a AE flood zone, elevation eight. There's a, as I said earlier, there is a coastal bank on the site. Uh, it has a history of erosion. That erosion currently seems to be under control, and um, that extends down to the to the uh, bottom of the timber bulkhead at the site. From there, we have a coastal beach that, um, by by re definition, extends from mean low water landward to this timber bulkhead. It's a fairly low gradient beach, and that low gradient extends offshore. Um, mean low water at the site is uh, elevation 0 0.2 on the mean low and low water datum. And that basically follows a, a, a line that arcs along the outer, more seaward edge of the four groins that are present along the waterfront. In case you're interested, mean high water is up around elevation 3.2. Again, mean low, low water datum. So we have a three-foot tidal range at the site. Uh, two other resource areas that really should be the focus of, of our discussion this evening are uh, land under the ocean, which is everything seaward of mean low water, and land containing shellfish, uh, which uh, based on maps that are published by the Division of Marine Fisheries, we have uh, land containing shellfish, suitable habitat for both quahogs and bay scallops. Um, a couple of other sensitive resources that are, are certainly worth des describing here are uh, areas of historic eelgrass and, and existing eelgrass at the site. Um, the figure behind Art Gasparo on the, on the tripod right now shows, um, I'll go to the board briefly to point it out to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's the green shaded region that you can see that the proposed dock and, and the existing dock both span. That's the, the most recent mapping that we have from DEP uh, from their efforts in 2015-2017 era, the extent of eelgrass at the site, where the proposed dock crosses, which is again shown as our red line on that figure, uh, it crosses a band of, at a uh, width of about 150 feet. So um, as Art mentioned, we did um, engage CR Environmental to go out and do uh, two rounds of eelgrass surveys at the site. The first uh, round is uh, uh, described in the report that's attached to the Notice of Intent application. That was a, an attempt to get a, a good wide angle look at the extent of eelgrass on the site, both in terms of its uh, distance offshore, but also trying to get a sense as to um, where it exists laterally and in what, what densities. And what we found from that survey was a, a, you know, a pretty patchy distribution. There's, there are areas within that 
green shaded region where the eelgrass is uh, moderate to even high density. And there's just as many areas where the eelgrass is, is not present. So it's, we describe it as a, as a patchy distribution, um, which contrasts very well with the uh, more healthy eelgrass that we observed further offshore uh, towards the, the middle of the harbor. And I can point that out to you on, in one of the figures in the NOI if you're interested. This area of eelgrass that we observed closer in, would not, I would not describe it, a CR environmental certainly did not describe it as a healthy eelgrass community. It was, um, and it, we don't just base that on the patchiness of the distribution. There was a lot of brown algae, um, distressed plants, and that is evidenced in the many uh, photographs that are included in the eelgrass report. Um, from the video transects that they that they collected on site. So we, we certainly are sensitive to eelgrass. We recognize it's an important resource and we're, we, we're certainly doing what we can to minimize the impact. Um, Art, can you, can you bring up the other photo, the one that doesn't show the all of the overlays? Oh. Yeah, that's fine. You might ask why the, the dock has a, a dog leg in it. And I think you can get a sense of that from looking at this photograph. We wanted to try to take advantage of an area of low density eelgrass that you can see pretty readily in that photograph there. Um, we're not discounting it as potential eelgrass habitat, but it is an area where the eelgrass is, is absent. And so we initially targeted that alignment that you see on the plan, the, the, the plans that are in your notice of intent application. But we weren't satisfied with the level of information, so we did send CR out again, and they conducted a second round of surveys at about the same time that this was being submitted. And we can certainly provide you the, the report from that survey, but it essentially confirms the information that we obtained in the, the more broad scale survey that was completed earlier in the year. So I, I want to just... Um, emphasize some of the points and I forgive you uh, please forgive me for repeating some of these things because it was part of Art's presentation but I do think it's it, these are valid points that should be understood um, we have made a lot of effort to try to minimize the extent of the eelgrass impact both by direct pile impact and potential impacts that could result from shading <coughs> the dock is designed at, at a minimum width necessary to, to function as a dock it's only three feet wide which um, is essentially the width of the boardwalk that we walked on yesterday. And you notice that when we tried to pass one another, it was rather tight. And that's about the minimum width that we could, we could really propose here. Um, the, the width of it is relevant because the amount of sunlight that gets under, uh, under a dock is uh, directly related to the, to the width of the structure and the height of the structure which is the second component of the design that's critical to the eelgrass. This is going to be elevated five feet above mean high water, which is significant. If you consider mean high water being about three feet above mean low water, and two feet, two feet of depth at the, at the deepest part here, we're getting this very uh, narrow structure a good distance up, up, up over it so that sunlight can get down to the area <laughs> under the dock. Uh, another aspect of this dock, it's a, it's a fortunate coincidence in all honesty, but the alignment of this dock is, is such that we're able to uh, get more of the sunlight getting underneath it. We, uh, the worst case scenario, of course, is a dock with an east-west orientation because that'll set up a situation where the, there's a pretty much a constant shadow zone that the, you'll be, the uh, seabed never escapes from. Whereas if the dock is arranged in a configuration more north-south or North, in this case, northwest, you will have that shifting of the sun as it makes its arc across the sky, and you will not have an area that's entirely in shadow always. So, um, those are, are the main points in the design that really relate directly to eelgrass. Oh, uh, one other the spacing on the piles is, is significant here. This is not your standard spacing of the yokes that form the, the pairs of piles, and called yokes, that form the supports for the piles. We are uh, really reaching out with these and, and getting the maximum separation that we feel we can accomplish so that we reduce the amount of pile, uh, pile impact overall. These are spaced 20 feet apart. 
um, in ter excuse me, in terms of resource area impacts, I can um, report to you in ter uh, for the uh, various resource areas involved. Uh, the coastal beach impact of the, the dock over coastal beach, the area of the dock itself is 161 square feet. That does not account for the area of the existing dock that's being removed. So I'm talking about just the new dock without taking any credit for the structure that's being removed. Um, just looking at this, I think it's probably going to be a wash when we're all said and done that the amount of new structure will, it may even be less than the existing structure that is located within Coastal Beach, but we'll have to verify that. As far as land under the ocean, it's 725 square feet. We're assuming all of that is also within land containing shellfish, so there's 725 square feet of footprint within land containing shellfish. And again, the area of historic eelgrass mapped eelgrass at the site, about 150 feet wide, so that's 450 square feet of potential shading impact. Um, what does that mean in terms of, of direct pile impact? Well, it's, it's pretty small, actually. We figure there'll be about 6.3 square feet of contact with piles on the coastal beach, 20.5 square feet of pile impact in land under the ocean and land containing shellfish, and about 10 and a half square feet of pile impact in the mapped eelgrass area. Okay. Um, I'll keep going unless you, if you have any questions that you'd like to stop me at, at this point. Okay. No, I think we've all pretty much read it pretty thoroughly, and thank you for. I'm pretty. Yeah, thank you. I'm. I just wanted to make sure that those that are in the audience and oh, listening absolutely. have a good understanding as well. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about mitigation, although our mitigation program is admittedly um, not as defined as as we would like to be, but um, we there there are reasons for that. In terms of, of shellfish mitigation, we certainly plan on performing pre-installation removal surveys where we would have divers uh, gathering up the shellfish that are in the, in the area of this dock. Uh, any shellfish that are within the, uh, the vicinity of each pile would be removed prior to the pile being installed and relocated to a suitable location that's determined in consultation with the Division of Marine Fisheries and the shell, local shellfish constable. Um, we also would like to engage the town's Department of Natural Resources to determine if there's a way that the applicant can uh, support the town's shellfish propagation efforts. And we intend to move forward with those discussions in the coming weeks. And ho hopefully we'll be able to report to the commission at our, at our next meeting any <coughs> progress there. Uh, in terms of eelgrass impact, we, we feel strongly that the design of the dock will itself mitigate for a lot of the potential damage to, to eelgrass, but there is certainly a, uh, um, a likelihood that there will be some impact, and we would uh, want to be able to, at the very least, mitigate for the uh, amount of impact that occurs at the individual piles, uh, as well as any other potential shading impact. Those discuss we, we had hoped that we would be able to piggyback on some of the eelgrass restoration efforts that are underway by the town by the town and the Nantucket Land Council. We did ho have a, a meeting to just explore the idea informally with the Nantucket Land Council, and unfortunately, um, it is evident that we will not be able to work cooperatively, at least at this point. And so, we are prepared. The applicant, I should say, is prepared to go it alone, and. Uh, provide the commission with our own independent eelgrass restoration program that would be largely modeled on the same efforts that are underway currently by the town and the Nantucket Land Council. Um, it's not a preference, but if that's what we, if that's what the applicant has to do, he's willing to do it. With respect to the performance standards that apply under the Wetland Protection Act and the uh, Nantucket Wetland Protection Regulation, um, briefly on, on coastal beaches, 
The performance standards relate primarily to um, the effects of, of uh, uh, sediment transport, alterations in water circulation, alteration in sediment grain sizes, uh, changes in water quality due to uh, yeah, changes in turbidity or other pollutants. Um, the dock obviously is going to be constructed of inert timbers, uh, uh, non-CCA treated lumber. There will be no impact to water quality resulting from this. There may be a temporary impact to turbidity, turbidity during the pile driving, but these are not uh, significant uh, pollutants. And we feel that the project as proposed, because it's a pile supported structure meeting all of the design criteria of the state will satisfy those um, that requirements that there be no such alterations. Of course, the project cannot have a uh, impact to any specified habitat of rare species. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that we do have rare species habitat out over the uh, watershed of Nantucket Harbor that the project will um, encroach into at its seaward end. So um, the NOI was sent off to the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program and they provided us with a comment letter indicating that the project would not have a, an impact to rare species habitat. So we, we satisfy that performance standards as well. The Nantucket Wetland Protection Regulations with respect to coastal beach, the performance standards that apply to coastal beach, it's interesting, but there are several additional performance standards related to dredging, fertilizer, setbacks for buildings, um, these sorts of things, but nothing that really applies to, uh, to docks, other than the fact that it states clearly that the performance standards that apply to land under the ocean under the Nantucket regulation will also apply to Coastal Beach. So we'll address those um, performance standards in uh, land under ocean, in the land under ocean section of this presentation, which we are going to get into right now. For projects like docks that are in land under the ocean, uh, they cannot affect the bottom topography so as to create, uh, increase the potential for storm damage or erosion of coastal beaches, coastal banks, coastal dunes, or salt marshes. This project will have no effect on, on bottom topography, so there will be no uh, impacts associated with that to meet that performance standard. There's also standard that a standard that relates to uh, minimization of adverse effects on marine fisheries habitat or wildlife habitat caused by alterations in water circulation, uh, destruction of eelgrass or widgeon grass, alteration of distribution of sediment grain size, changes in water quality or other pollutants, and the alteration of shallow submerged lands with high densities of polychaetes, mollusks, and macrophytic algae. The key word in that particular performance stand is minimize. It, it states that the project must be constructed to minimize adverse impacts. To minimize adverse impacts. It does not state that it cannot have an adverse impact. So we feel that, the, again, by the design, we feel that the, the impacts that are going to be um, caused to any of these listed resources are minimized. We've done that. Additional performance standards for land under the ocean that apply under the Nantucket Wetland Protection Regulation are very similar in a lot of ways to the performance standards that apply under the State Act. There are a couple of differences, however. One of the important ones that has to be addressed in this case is the provision that residential piers shall not displace public moorings without written approval from the harbor master. We know there are several moorings in this area opposite 46 Shimmel Pond Road. We are trying to obtain records from the town to help determine exactly where the moorings are. At this point, we don't know whether or not any of the moorings will be affected and have to be relocated to allow this dock to be built. But we are working to, to determine that and we can provide that information to the commission when it becomes available. 
Excuse me, may, may I ask, do we, are, I thought some of those moorings were actually being used. Is that not right um, at, the, at the current time? I mean, that you would know where they are because they are, in fact, being used? Well, the practice is to remove the moorings in the wintertime, mm -hmm. and then they get replaced, presum presumably in the same location. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so I'm saying you can't, you don't see them now, but... Yes. Okay. We do see them if you look at aerial, topo aerial right. images. Right, no, that's what I'm saying, because that that's why I was having trouble with why don't we know where they are, why, why don't you know where they are, yeah. so... We're, we're working on it, and we'll, we'll develop that information for you. Okay, and, and it might be useful also to know what draft, uh, what's the draft of the, the, the uh, boats that, that use those moorings. I would be interested in knowing that. Mm -hmm. There's also a provision in the, uh, under the local regulation that no solid fill piers will be permitted. We're not a solid fill pier. We're a pile-supported pier. And similarly, there's a, for a water-dependent project such as ours, it must be designed and, and carried out so as to cause no ad adverse effect on wildlife, erosion control, marine fisheries, shellfish beds, storm damage prevention, flood control, recreation, and aquatic vegetation. So here, here we have, again, the concept of an adverse effect. We don't feel that the project as proposed will have an adverse effect. We're not saying the project will have no effect. We acknowledge, we concede that it will, but we do not believe it will have an adverse effect on any of these listed resources. And of course, we acknowledge and concede that the Commission may impose additional requirements as necessary to protect the interests protected by the bylaw. Lastly, for land containing shellfish, there are, uh, again, similar to the, the uh, performance standards in a lot of ways that apply to land under the ocean, but there are a few um, differences here that are, are worth bringing to, to everyone's attention. Um, most notably, uh, 310 CMR 10.3452, projects which temporarily have an adverse effect on the shellfish productivity, but which do not permanently destroy the habitat, may be permitted if the land containing shellfish can and will be returned substantially to its former productivity in less than one year from the commencement of work, unless an extension of the order of conditions is granted, in which case, such restoration shall be completed within one year of such extension. Again, through our mitigation, we are planning on removing any shellfish that are located in harm's way, basically uh, at the location of the pile. We will also remove any, uh, well, we would remove any of the, the uh, cohogs that are uh, below the seabed, as well as any scallops that are in the area, and make sure that they are relocated to a safe spot before the uh, piles are driven. So we don't feel that there will be any temporary, really, or lasting effect to the productivity of the, res of the shellfish resource at the site. We feel we meet that performance standard. The issuing authority, item three, the issuing authority may, after consultation with the shellfish constable, permit the shellfish to be moved from such area under the guidelines of to a suitable location approved by the Division of Marine, Fish Division of Marine Fisheries in order to permit a proposed project on such land. So that's exactly what we're talking about here, is a relocation of, of shellfish in order to um, protect them, in this case. Just a reminder. And lastly, uh, and we've already addressed this, no project may be permitted which will have an adverse effect on specified habitat of rare species. With that, I don't have anything more to say this evening. Certainly um, available to answer any questions you might have about um, the project or the performance standards. But I'd like to just turn it over to the commission at this point. And and just before we do that, um, you know we're uh, we're.
are aware you've, you've got other things going on. Uh, and there are a lot of people here, and I suspect most of them are here for this. Um, so rather than try and what we sometimes do, which is answer questions right away and back and forth, I think what we're going to suggest is we'll just take in everything. I mean, we're certainly happy to answer any questions if you want them answered on the spot if we can. But in order to be a little bit more efficient, uh, we'll take in the questions and then we'll respond to them in writing before the next hearing. Thank you, Dan. To my fellow commissioners? Um, yeah, I'm opposed to this, along with the ZBA elephant you have in front of you. I just think the impact of putting the pair in, I think the shadowing from the dark, shadowing of the boat or boats, depending on what is at the, the pier, um, along with prop wash, I think just day-to-day -day activity. I know you say that we know that adverse impact, but I think you're going to have a daily impact with this. And um, yeah, I'm just not in favor of that because there's just so many things against this as far as unhealthy eelgrass in this area. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I, um, I invite my phone from you. No, no, I, I share your concerns. Um, I wanted to make a point about the fact that there seems to be a, a kind of implication that because the the eelgrass in this spot is um, um, you know spotty and and not you know terribly well established in parts of it, uh, to my mind that's kind of like you have a patient who's already sick, so you don't want to do anything to impact a patient who's already not doing well. So that the fact that this is a uh, a spot which in the past, at some point in time, was in better shape. We just don't know when. But putting in, and I share um, Joe's concerns, that this would be, um, you know, how much more does it take to put an area over the edge? And and this is a, a um, it's very hard to see the, the um, balancing the recreational, potential recreational use versus the damage to permanent damage because this is a permanent dock this isn't one that's going to be removed um, obviously um, after the the summer season um, so I would I, I find it very hard to see um, why we would be willing to accept this yeah I, um, it was pretty shocking to see the comparison between how healthy the eelgrass was in the 1990s it was uh, 2012, 2012 to 18, yeah. So, yeah, I have a long list of things to say, <laughs> but I'll just start with one and then I'll let someone else talk. But I'm trying to wrap my mind here around how the concept of ecological restoration works. So you as the applicant are trying to say that you're going to remove the shellfish from the area prior to installment of the dock place them in a suitable area, and then within one year, return the area to uh, its previous condition. But how shellfish recruitment works is the adult shellfish in an area spawn, and then those, shell those, those spawn attach to suitable substrate and grow. And yes, shellfish spawn are, they, they are, you know, free swimming in many cases, but if you remove all the adults from the area and then degrade the area to where a, to a condition where it's not suitable habitat, you're never gonna get recruitment again in that area. You would be more likely to get recruitment if you actually left the shellfish in the area, because at least they would try to spawn there and probably fail, unfortunately, but at least they would try. If you move them to somewhere else, they're gonna try there and be successful there, but this area is going to be permanently degraded and never have shellfish again. Apart, in addition to that, the impacts that you've um, identified with disturbance to eelgrass, I think are very underestimated. I see what you're trying to say about the fact that the surface or the, the area of the pilings is relatively small, but with a dock, and its ancillary uses, or its, I guess its intended use, like um, 
tying up a boat, you have to calculate also the shading from the boat, the propeller wash from the boat, the travel back and forth between that area, what people are going to do from that boat, like fishing or having their kids jump off and whatever it is, there's a whole list of concerns that actually occur not just based on the physical structure, but on the intended use use change in the area. So I just can't wrap my mind around how that potentially minimal impact at first will ever be restored because over time this area is going to see increased impact with the use, not decreased. My concern is eelgrass foremost. Um, I didn't hear you talking too much about during the construction, the barge is more than likely going to be sitting on the bottom at many locations. Uh, I actually worked on the crew who built the pier to the west, southwest, in the late 80s. And uh, the shellfisher men did clear out the areas where we suspected the barges were set. We had to give them a location mm -hmm. each time uh, throughout the progress of that pier, wherever we let it. Tie, you know, set on the bottom. Um, there's that consideration, but I just think the eelgrass is uh, two phases of that alone is um, putting it in quite quite a bit of peril out there. Your brother. Yes, sir. I would second what uh, has been said about the environmental impact, but also I'm a fisherman and a sailor, and uh, having a 200 foot long protrusion, a third one in this area will greatly restrict the amount of glass fishing that will go on there, as well as uh, I know shallow draft sailboats go in there. I've been in there on my laser. Um, so I'll uh, have a recreational effect on the uh, using the entire harbor for a recreational spot. Also, I'd like to know the history of the existing pier or dock. Uh, I don't know if we have that. Um, it looks pretty new right now. It's been re replaced, obviously, recently. And I think it would be handy to have that on the record of when the pier was originally built. Yes, and we have a letter in our package which I believe refers to the fact that there was no pier there before. I think the, the dyers wrote, the uh, former abutters. That there I don't was, think they used the word pier, though. It was a walkway, isn't it? I think they used the word pier, actually. Okay. Looking at my notes, but I don't have it right in front of me. Okay. But no, I take your point entirely. One more question I have is, um, what will uh, this is for, <coughs> for Arthur really? What will the end of the pier look like when we're all through? Will there be a floaty at the end? No. Uh, there'll be out offshore pilings. Yes. Uh, how far offshore will they be from the end of the pier? They would be not off the end of the pier um, to the north, but instead on the plan, they're shown located to the east. So it would be uh, similar to the fixed portion of the town pier, where you've got a fixed portion of the pier and two outhaul pilings. Gotcha. Thank you. If you look really closely, sorry to interrupt, you can see the two red circles um, on the, the plan. Just one clarification question about the existing wooden structure that's there. So the, I understand you have a chapter 91 waterways license for that. But it looks to me that that license is was filed 2019. Yeah. Was that structure licensed before then, or has it just been licensed this year? Uh, it was licensed based on pre-existing, um, being a pre-existing structure. So in your files, um, which we could provide again for the record if you want, um, there are um, documentation of the history of that um, of that pier. So it was an unlicensed structure that existed. And okay. we provided at the time, I believe a 1971 aerial photograph that showed a structure, uh, some <coughs> site there. There's also a uh, history in um, the commission files of repair and maintenance of that structure. And so in my understanding, I know this isn't exactly in our purview, but in my understanding of chapter 91, a significant change to the structure that's already been licensed would require a new filing of Chapter 91? This would certainly require a revised Chapter 91 license, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I was going to ask that question as well because it talks about maintaining existing structures and this is, goes far beyond 
whatever you want to I mean, call they, the boardwalk or pier or yeah, whatever. I mean, they, they uh, okay. DEP does have a provision for minor modifications like most permitting agencies, yeah. but you know, if you go beyond 10%, usually it's you know not going anywhere. Right, okay. Yeah, so also getting back to lands uh, containing shellfish, we have a, a provision in our local bylaw that says any um, project causing a detrimental effect to base call populations needs to, um, can't be permitted without a waiver. And I am a recreational scalloper, scalloped in this area many times from Cathcart to Pimney's Point across that whole stretch. It's one of the most productive places in either Nantucket or Madigan Harbor to gather base scallop. And what we see, especially in this area, is um, eelgrass that is already stressed and additional stress stressing in that area by installation of a pier is going to decrease that productivity. So that would be a detrimental effect to me. And I think a waiver would need to be submitted for that, but it hasn't been included in the NOI. So uh, I'm going to open this up to the public. And I've been reminded to not repeat myself and ask uh, others not to repeat what's already been presented. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, and I think they're going to need to use the microphone. Yeah, so, yeah. I'll back up. thanks. Thank you. My name is <clears throat> Steve Anderson. Um, I live on South Valley Road. Um, I'm involved with the uh, Shemo Association as secretary treasurer and on the uh, on the board. Uh, we've lived here year round for around 20 years. Um, as has been pointed out on the on the uh, chart and mentioned, the Shemo Association owns a piece of land. It's about a half acre that uh, is on the waterfront. And looking from the land to the water, you can see up here on the left, and that's the one at 42 Schimmel Pond Road, um, which was built probably in the 1920s and is owned by the uh, Stewart family. Um, and I think you have received a letter from Lonnie Stewart describing yeah. his uh, concerns. Um, to the right of the association parking lot or land is the house under construction and the proposed uh, applicants proposed pier for 46 Shimmel Pond Road. Um, the location of this proposed pier is about uh, 400 feet to the right of the existing pier. The association, um, and, and by the way, the, the association um, board met on December 4th and voted unanimously to oppose <coughs> the applicant's uh, proposal to construct a new pier at 46 Shimmel Pond Road. Um, the location of this pier um, will have a, a significant adverse recreational impact to the use of the association's property. Uh, there is a mooring field. That photo shows about five moorings. There's more like 20 moorings in that uh, mooring field. There also is a, um, we also have uh, dinghy racks or boat racks at the end of the, uh, on the beach, the steps down to the beach and then boat racks. And they contain kayaks, dinghies, paddle boards and so forth. Um, often there are two or three sunfish that are dragged up onto the beach. So all things being considered, there's 20 plus moorings, probably another 20 or so um, small craft that are used. And a lot of people sail. Um, Mark mentioned about sailing a laser in there. 
Um, there are several beetle cats that don't necessarily move that easy uh, the, and uh, easy to get annoyance in, in there. Um, a few um, Hirschhoff 12 and a half sunfish and so forth. And with the prevailing southwest wind and a rising tide, it is not the easiest field to leave, whether it's the mooring or from the beach. Um, putting in another pier to where it's proposed will make it very narrow and very hard to navigate. And this is in violation of one of the performance standards in the uh, wetlands regulation. Um, the, pier, the water is very shallow there. Um, and uh, I think the depth at low tide would probably be more in the area of three feet and at high tide roughly three feet higher than that. And that's, that's very low and, and certainly will cast shadows and so forth and have other impact on the aquatic uh, and the uh, uh, shellfish beds and so forth. The amount of shellfish has decreased substantially and very much it is necessary to restore eelgrass in that part of the harbor to uh, allow shellfish to uh, spawn and reproduce. 10 or 15 years ago, when the recreational season would open on October 1, there would be a dozen cars and trucks there ready to go out scalloping. Now there are none. Um, and I can attest to that, there really are no scallops here. Far fewer quahogs than in the past. Um, it was very easy to gather a bucket in no time, and now you can't, and blue crabs are gone. A lot of this is due to the degradation of the water quality, primarily with the loss of the eelgrass. And it is absolutely critical that eelgrass be um, restored in this area. And everything possible should be done to have that happen. Um, the notice of intent that we received, uh, attachment A, section 1.0, uh, states that the applicant is seeking permission to extend an existing dock. The existing structure that is on the beach in no way is considered to be an existing dock or an existing pier. It never has been. It has no use and no function at that. At half tide, it is out of the water. Um, uh, it's another person from the Shimmer area will be speaking shortly, and I think you may have seen her letter in the, uh, in the material. There was also just recently some mention ma mentioned to a Chapter 91 Act uh, from the Mass Department of uh, Environmental Protection. And there was a license granted on April 17, 2019, which allowed the applicant to, quote unquote, maintain an existing pre-1984 pier slash dock. Um, a pier is defined as, as a structure built on or over water supported on columns or piles and used as a walk or a landing place for ships. I question whether that dock, that structure on the beach was ever a pier or a dock. Therefore, this application is for a new structure, not, not um, uh, maintaining an existing structure. Um, in, kind of in summary, the new pier will adversely affect the quality of the harbor, sustainability of shellfish, um, for us, uh, in the association, access to moorings and, and not only access to moorings, but access to the use of the moorings, the purpose which is sailing and, and boating, and it'll prevent use, uh, uses of the waterfront in many, in a number of ways. There is no public benefit of this period. In fact, there's adverse uh, impact to the public. This sets a very undesirable precedent for the future of our harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. RJ TJ. <laughs> RJ Turcotte, Nantucket Land Council. Um, the Land Council submitted a comment letter. I hope you've all had an opportunity to read it. I'm just going to reiterate some of the main points for you guys tonight. First, I'd like to get out of the way. The word patchy has been thrown around by the applicants and sort of in a negative light. And in fact, it's one of the hallmarks of the species. Eelgrass, you, you don't get a full beautiful eelgrass meadow full of scallops and cohogs and fish overnight. It starts as this patchy distribution and it slowly works its way out. 
Historically, this area had eelgrass. It shoaled over with sand during storm events. Now it's patchy because it's starting to work its way back. It's starting to attempt to grow back. And it's fighting against the current, so to speak. There's a lot of issues. It's light limited. It's competing with algae for that limited light. There's a lot of nutrients coming into the water, which the town and the local community has really worked hard to limit by limiting fertilizer and controlling stormwater and all of those things. So it's already struggling, but it is slowly growing back. In fact, we're planting at the land council's restoration site in patches, in groups of five. We stick them into the bottom and hope that they survive and slowly work their way out and colonize. Inhibiting growth of this keystone species is going to have a cascading effect for all the other beloved species in the harbor, whether it be acting as a nursery for fish or a scallop habitat, or even as far as erosion goes, it acts as a natural wave attenuator. So it takes the energy out of waves from a storm and can slow down erosion behind it. So eelgrass is a keystone species. It's enormously important, and this is an important area that has the potential to have eelgrass again. The applicant hasn't applied for any waivers, and as it stands, we don't believe that they could meet any of the commission's requirements for these waivers. And lastly, that adjacent restoration site that the land council is working on, the commission approved that, and the community in Nantucket has really come together. I've been working on restoration projects for the better part of 10 years now, and I've never been a part of a project like this. Local businesses, volunteers, um, other environmental groups, the Natural Resources Department employees, and obviously those of us at the Land Council, researchers from Boston University, are all working together to try to get this area back to what it once was. And there's no guarantee that's going to work, but this pier will definitely have a detrimental impact to the resource area, and if the commission were to permit it, it would be a reversal on everything the commission, the town, the community, and our environmental group is working to accomplish here. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is B. Ganella and Dyer Ganella, and I hate to admit it, but I'm here to re give you the historic perspective on it. I have been swimming, sailing, fishing, walking that beach, cohogging it for 74 years. In 1946, my family purchased the property next door, and we lived in it from 1946 to 1948. Now I live at 14 South Valley Road, which was part of their property many, many years ago, and I'm currently in a butter as part of the Shimo Association. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, certainly as Steve said, by definition, a pier goes out over the water. That never was a pier. It never was anything except a boardwalk. The, current, the man who built it, built it, as a boardwalk, he built the groins that are in existence today. And he used that boardwalk to uh, stage his, his chains and his pulleys and his ropes because he had a little raft and he went out and he got all the stones that were out in the harbor and he brought them back in and created the groins. And he used the boardwalk as a staging area. And he built it in the 40s. I mean, I was there when, when he built it, and at that point in time, it never even went to the water. As you have said, erosion has been about a half a foot a year. Do the math. That's at least 35 feet of erosion. The water has since come up to it. It never went down to the water. Um, and now you can't even walk along the beach without climbing over it. Uh, and God forbid you should be handicapped. I may want to go as m in my walker one of these days. I couldn't get by that as it's existing now. And um, for that reason, we are absolutely opposed to it and want to say that, as I say, if you are talking historic precedent, it was never anything but a boardwalk. It was never a dock. It was never a pier. It never went out into the water. And I hope that you will deny the application for it. 
Thank you for that historical uh, perspective. If I may. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for hearing everybody's concerns tonight. My name's Andy Lowell. I'm representing the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board. It is our mission and duty to make recommendations necessary for the proper use and management of the harbors, water, and shellfish in the town of Nantucket. This proposal was discussed at two of our public meetings, resulting in a full board unanimous vote to issue our letter of opposition to you, which I believe you have. As you know, we have no regulatory authority. You are the first and foremost for us to voice our concerns for action and results. Our board is elected, therefore, it is also our duty to relay the voices of our constituents. All of our board members have heard concerns from all walks of life here on island about this proposal. Most importantly, commercial shell fishermen rely on us to be their voice. Please consider our statement to you, along with the Nantucket Shellfish Association statement and the Nantucket Land Council statement together, that we're all aligned in our decision on this application, and we hope that you agree. Something I haven't heard too much tonight talked about, but I know there's a lot more discussion to take place, is boater safety. Voter safety should also be considered, addressed, and taken very seriously. I would hate to imagine encountering this pier in the fog. In my five plus decades of tra traversing this harbor, I've experienced nail-biting travel in low visibility. This structure will threaten lives. I wish there are, were a record kept of how many boaters have hit the nearby Abrams Rock. And it is a speck in size in comparison to this pier. I ask all of you, have you ever heard of the term being clotheslined? In the worst case, it is decapitating. Fog takes boaters by surprise. You may ask, well, what are you doing out there in the fog? The fog can roll in without notice. Some boaters have to be out there every day. Oyster farmers, shell fishermen who rely on their livelihood. All boaters traveling to and from Pulpus Harbor, Pocomo, Quays, Walwinet, Cascada, Kotu will be subject to the dangers of navigating the structure. Many youth learning to be boaters are seen in this area. A popular 13-foot whaler or runabout could fit under this pier at any tide leaving only the occupant's upper bodies or head to be in the impact area. I ask all of you to remember some 15 years ago news headlines of three major league ball players impacting a pier like this. Visualize that in your mind when making your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. So I could hit the rock and crank it. Kevin. Hello, Kevin Kuster. I'm representing the Nantucket Shellfish Association. Um, I want to point out one important thing that you've been referring to uh, base scallops tonight as base scallops. We have the only place where there are Nantucket base scallops. We are the last wild base scallop fishery in the world. This is like putting a pier in the Galapagos Islands. You cannot allow it. I don't want to repeat what everybody else has said, but uh, we have roughly 400 members. We've heard from many of them. They're you know, all unanimously opposed to it. Uh, we sent a letter that I think you all got. Um, that this is important to the fishery. It's important to the citizens. And I think it's important to all of you guys. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Yvonne Valancourt, 
concerned citizen, and um, I actually don't live too far from here. I am out at the field station, director of the field station. I have concerns um, for all the reasons people have already raised. I think this would be a really bad idea. Uh, I don't think you can mitigate the damage that you would do by further fragmenting our um, remaining eelgrass beds, which were uh, historically robust out here quite a long time ago. And I think um, we're hopeful that that will return and that this would be uh, very detrimental to do. Um, I think uh, rather than repeat everything everyone else has said about that, I do want to add one more biological reality that there will be some shade produced. Um, and that will lead to uh, things that do well following organisms that you see all over the piers and other places will grow. And they could um, end up growing on the remaining eelgrass that is in the area. Uh, that is a possibility, and they would, you know, that it could lead to a uh, uh, things like tunicates and sponges encrusting on top of eelgrass. So it would provide a very nice long structure where things like that flourish, and all they have to do is end up in the water and, and spread out onto the eelgrass. So that is a concern. I don't know if it would happen for sure, but it's something that does happen in some places. Um, so that's another thing to add to the biological list that would be why you wouldn't want to do this. Um, but I, th I also think that uh, living where I do and seeing the wind in the water come in in the middle of a storm, I could really envision quite well how the water would just come right up <laughs> along a pier like that and blast into the shoreline. So I think it would uh, affect the rate of erosion pretty dramatically. Um, and I just, I could go on and on, uh, but I just wanted to add those few things. Um, I oppose this officially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, hi there, uh, Edie Ray. Usually when I come and talk to you guys, I have a comment about things with wings, which I know more about than things that live below the water. However, I spent a lot of my childhood along the Monomoy Shimo Beach. My family was lucky enough to rent a house along there for many years. And my experience in that area of, of um, um, diving and swimming and whatnot, I, re I remember, and in taking my grandchildren there, I know that it's very silty there. So when you go swimming and you've got flippers on or anything, the visibility very, very quickly goes down. I can only imagine if my little feet can produce that much turbulence, what having a barge come in and shading that area underneath the barge, you know, that's going to be shaded. I don't think anybody's talked about that yet for the period of time of construction. Also banging those things, those pilings down into the water is going to create an immense amount of turbulence. And if they've got divers out there moving shellfish and digging up things and moving cohogs around, that's more turbulence. So you're going to have a lot of uh, basically a smothering effect with the turbulence of, of this project happening, if God forbid it does, not only in this particular area that um, is owned by these folks, but depending on which way the tide is running and the wind, it's going to extend for I don't even know how far up and down along that shoreline. I don't know if they've done any sort of uh, tidal flow studies to sort of see where, where that, that disturbed sediment is going to go. But I think that that's something that needs to be considered as well. It's going to not only impact their little bit of beach, but lots of other places as well. And it's, it's so concerning and scary to me. Thank you. Thank you. A few more things to say. You have a few more things to say? Yeah. Go for it, Seth. <laughs> so if Edie's not going to talk about things with wings, I will. Um, <laughs> my background is in water bird ecology, and we know that these species 
We know that that area is a productive water bird environment for things like brant and gulls and shorebirds and terns. And when you remove uh, eelgrass, which provides forage areas and cover for things like small fish and polychaete worms and aquatic invertebrates, you're also going to reduce the productivity of that area for the, the birds that eat them. So we're gonna see an ecological cascade occur in that area where not only are the marine animals that we all kind of have in our mind, uh, fish and shellfish are gonna suffer, but the rest of the food web that relies on these species is also gonna suffer as a result. I think we need to take that into consideration as well. And then just one technical thing about the underwater video survey, um, it seems to me that the applicant is using the photos or you know the information in the video survey to try to, and also the other data they took, side scan and bathymetry, to try to play this site off as um, an area that's basically in poor condition for eelgrass. And the reality is that is not exactly true. You can see in the images provided that there are concerns. You can see epiphytic growth. You can see discoloration in some of the plates. But in, the, in some of the other plates, you have quite a bit of actual, actually a relatively large um, leaf blades there. And you can also see patchy areas in the photos where what looks like relatively healthy young eelgrass shoots are growing up in an attempt to recolonize kind of open sandy environments. It's been said already, so I won't get into it too much, but eelgrass is a pretty proficient colonizer. It grows in this patchy distribution. Um, scallops and, and cohogs and other um, species that thrive in these environments also can do quite well on the edge. Um, and when there's open areas of, of sand or of, of ocean bottom, uh, we're actually seeing in these photos that there is some evidence that eelgrass shoots from the, the area, adjacent areas trying to recolonize in, in some of the, the video plates. So I think we need to take into consideration that this area is not, not too far gone. It has some issues. You know, there's codium there, and there's other other issues that could be looked into and restored. But doing something like adding a pier is only going to make it worse. Versus if we let the environment um, maintain in its natural state, and especially with efforts from the Nantucket Land Council to plant a, eel, a healthy eelgrass bed relatively close to this area. Hopefully that, that project will get off the ground and be successful, and then we'll, we'll kind of merge and shift into this area as well to have more of a connected eelgrass resource. But putting a pier there is never gonna make that happen. So we need to do a better job of assessing the evidence that's been provided by CR Environmental to show that this is an area that has potential to still be productive as an eelgrass habitat and as a shellfish habitat. Thank you. So uh, would the applicant like to continue? Yes. Uh, March 18th. March 18th. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, we have some vacations leading the way in there. Okay. Until March 18th. Thank you. Uh, moving forward. Great State Properties, LLC, at 92 Washington Street Extension. <laughs> Let's see if they start talking here. Uh, I could talk forever. Ready? <laughs> 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 
Okay, we're ready to Arthur? go. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the applicant, Leo Azadorian with Blackwell Associates. I'm here with Arthur Reed. Uh, the application before you is for the removal of the existing structures at 92 Washington Street. Uh, yeah, I'm speaking with the builder. I understand that the floor joists uh, pretty rotted. Uh, the structural integrity of the building is such that it really needs to be raised. Uh, the architect has proposed uh, a new structure for the site. Uh, we've moved the building back uh, outside the velocity zone. Right now, a portion of, well, not portion, the total uh, deck on existing structure is in the velocity zone, and we've moved the structure back from the bulkhead, uh, grand total of about 14 feet. And uh, the plan also shows that we're going to probably be required to uh, have uh, public access down to the beach. And we also had shown on the plan uh, proposed ADA ramp. Not sure if that's going to be totally necessary. That might be up to uh, Division of Waterways uh, because there is an ADA ramp already available in public access uh, over at Great Harbor Yacht Club. I'm sure you've all seen that ramp that's over there. It's pretty substantial. And uh, the, the footprint change from the existing building uh, was an increase of about 309 square feet. And uh, again, we, we did move the building, the structure back. Now, the first floor elevation has to be at or above uh, the flood elevation of nine feet. Uh, Right now, the foundation is being designed by a structural engineer that's uh, actually designed the foundation for the garage itself. And uh, in speaking with him, uh, what they're going to do is basically have breakaway panels, which are recommended by uh, FEMA under their technical bulletin number eight. And uh, these breakaway panels, if we have a major storm, uh, they'll just they'll break away and allow the floodwaters to go through and underneath the building. The building will be secured by uh, piles underneath with piers. Uh, the panels aren't attached to the foundation whatsoever. So when they break away, and they're pretty strict uh, requirements for these breakaway panels to be uh, placed on a foundation like that. So when they do break away, if they ever do, uh, they won't bother with the structural integrity. I anticipate probably that they'll have uh, and those panels will be pretty much on the uh, east-west side of the building, the ocean side and the street side. Uh, I would imagine they'll probably have uh, smart vents on the east and west side, I mean the north and south side of the building to allow any floodwaters to go in if they had to. Uh, I don't see any need for, uh, and they don't either, of having the breakaway panels on those walls only because the flow would be directly from the ocean itself. Uh, that's pretty much it. We've left the garage where it's existing right now. We're not moving it. And again, uh, we think it's a workable project. In other words, a client will be able to enjoy his property the way he, he would like and uh, not uh, have to try to renovate that, that structure that's there right now because I understand, again, speaking with the contractor that uh, they've tried to get in there and it's just the, the, the floor joists are just so rotted that it really <coughs> needs to be redone. 
and here to answer any questions if you have them. Uh, first off, thank you for the breakaway panels because we've had some issues in this area um, with houses and just worried about, you know, with flooding and how, you know, how water um, would pick up speed and accelerate and go further uh, distance in, into um, the coast and inland. inland. So I thank you for raising this house. I think this will be a, a, a beneficial to this area. So. Mm -hmm. Any further comments? Any uh, public comments? Jeff, do we have, we have all of the required information? Yes. Would you like to close? If you don't have any more mm. questions, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> Seems. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your presentation. Welcome. Okay. Motion uh, close. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good enough. Good, Good enough. enough. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Congrats on your first application closing. <laughs> <laughs> it only took an hour. Hi. And I was hurrying it along. It's about quality, not quantity. There we go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, 53 Westchester Street, LLC. Thank you. That's warms the cockles in my heart. <laughs> For the applicant, Art Gasparo, and before you tonight for the second uh, public hearing for this notice of intent for um, landscaping work within the buffer zone to uh, um, vegetated wetland. There was some questions and concerns at the last hearing uh, concerning a uh, retaining wall and the extent of a curb and a patio, and the, um, the plan has been revised and we filed both a um, stamp site plan as well as a landscape plan where the retaining wall has been removed. Um, we maintain all of the um, invasive species control as originally proposed uh, with the application. They're looking to um, square up a lawn area, if you will. There's a small corner of that which goes into the 25 but again it's through an existing area that is uh, shrubs and invasive um, species and um, there's also a modification to um, the other stone patio that exists uh, so sort of a stone patio on both the uh, east and west side of the property though those have been maintained outside of the um, uh, 25 foot buffer zone so i hope that uh, changes that were made to the plan uh, address the concerns that the commission had and we'd be happy to address um, any remaining questions or concerns yeah we didn't actually get this in our package i don't believe What's it up? yeah oh, we did. Yeah. Oh, but it, no, it's down. they didn't it's take it down i submitted if i may a letter oh, no. with the plans attached i think in the packet it's the old stuff followed by the letter and those two plans no it doesn't look as though it's coming up on my anyway there we go Thank you. It is in there? It's in there, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, some I know, sorry. <laughs> I, I appreciate what you've done to remove the retaining wall and the curb. I just have one question about the lawn layout. Mm -hmm. Is the area that extends into the 25 foot buffer proposed to be a new lawn area or is that an existing no it's actually a, a reduction uh if i could point out to you on the plan the physical plan may may help you is sure. that uh this is existing edge of lawn actually comes further in so she's looking to put plantings in this area so the existing edge is here so we're actually improving the situation here. So and she wants it to be, I think, more formal. Yeah, I, I uh, by in terms of um, geometry. And is there going to be like any 
physical representation of that 25 foot buffer or is it just going to exist on the plan only right no there's no there's no um markers or any of that um uh, proposed uh again on the landscape plan you'd know i would note that um this cross hatched area is currently all lawn and is going to go to native plantings mm -hmm. that's what she's got on there uh wetland meadow seed mix a thousand square feet to replace lawn so i think it's a quite a bit of a, a net benefit thank you yeah i, I have it any questions from the public do we have everything we need to close we do have a close second second all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Seventeen uh, BR Rosalie Nominee Trusts at Seventeen Baxter Road. Thank you. Uh, Brian Madden from LEC Environmental. Um, based on the request at the last meeting, we submitted uh, additional information on the design for the proposed stairs um, that are located in excess of 50 feet to the offsite coastal dune. Um, we provided a um, we provided like a representative photograph and a detail uh, depicting uh, conceptual design. Um, and we've submitted uh, revised site plans on um, uh, prepared by Blackwell that show a mid landing that was added uh, given the length of it. And um, yeah, essentially four foot wide uh, set of stairs with handrails elevated 12 inches off grade, uh, spored by four by four posts on concrete sauna tube footings. And um, it's just gonna connect to that three foot wide existing path uh, and proposed uh, arrowwood shrubs at the um, uh, terminus to that and allow the remaining areas to, to fill in. And um, we had designated a limit of work associated with that. Uh, any temporary, temporarily disturbed areas uh, will be reseeded with a native uh, fescue seed mix and then just allow the woody vegetation, uh, that's mo ma mainly bayberry, to, to fill in naturally. Yep. So, um, great. Turn over to questions. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Any questions from the public? Uh, do we have everything we need to close? Yes, we do. Do we have a motion to close, please? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Margaret uh, Zarcone, is that a silent E or a 16 Cherry Street? I think it is. I see, okay. Uh, thank you for the record, Paul Santos from Nantucket Surveyors, uh, representing the applicant and property owner, Margaret Zarcone. Uh, this is a request for uh, a shallow depth in-ground swimming pool at the rear of an existing developed property located at 16 Cherry Street. Uh, there are no resource areas on the particular site. However, the property to the south, which is currently owned by uh, Nantucket Island Resorts, um, with the address being 20 Cherry Street, has on it a historic um, old isolated wetland um, that was has been there, I think, since a prior landscape. I believe there was a landscape, either business or operation on that property prior to NIR purchasing it, in which there was a series of um, portable greenhouses along the backside of that property. And this is an, an isolated wetland um, that has historically been on that property. Um, it was depicted um, back in the late 80s Again, we did um, utilize uh, the verified the wetland location 
and also permitted the existing structure that you see um, to the west of this um, of 16, which is the two-story dwelling shown on the plan in this particular area here. Um, that area actually, and this is from the CONCOM files, you'll see that this is the isolated area we're talking about where these were the historic greenhouses that were, were on that property. So the applicant proposes a small, shallow depth, um, four, four to five foot depth uh, pool on the backside of his property. The property itself, if you look at the photos, is currently, currently uh, developed. It's an existing lawn area with some um, slate um, stone into the back area. Um, the pool would be at the lower level of the property abutting an existing um, deck. The area itself is elevated above uh, the isolated wetland area. Um, we do not feel that we'll need a, a groundwater waiver in such that the pool depth is shallow enough. The pool will also be elevated um, somewhat on the, on the property itself. And based on HWH mapping and some augers that we did along the backside of the property, and we feel that we have the sufficient depth to maintain the two foot separation to groundwater. Um, so no waivers are requested. Um, the property, uh, the pool itself is right up against or right adjacent to that 50 foot no build zone, um, but it does comply with uh, the zoning setbacks that would be required to place the, uh, the pool area itself. Uh, we are outside any uh, mapped NHESP areas. We're not in a flood zone. And unfortunately, we do not have a DEP file number, so I will be asking you to continue um, okay. um, for tonight's meeting. I'd happy to answer any questions that you may, that you may have. Is it at the lowest point in the property? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the backside, um, that elevation tilt, there's actually a vertical, on the property line, there's a vertical um, timber retaining wall. I think it's actually um, old telephone posts, so like, like a round posts that, that have this property elevated. It's elevated about one and a half to two feet above um, the NIR property, but yes. Yeah, I would, I would just... Um, Ask the applicant to make sure that the corner that touches right up on the 50 foot buffer zone is well demarcated physically and uh, also that all the contractors on the site know specifically not to be entering into that area mm -hmm. so that we don't accidentally have a few feet go over into the to the next into the inside yeah. of the 50 foot yeah buffer. we would we would stake that typically as part of the yeah we'll do that as a, as a construction zone i have um delineated an area of silt fence too along the the back side of the property um again the, actually the regime between oddly enough the, the area between the isolate between this property and the isolated wetland is a fairly sandy it's a fairly sandy soil i was surprised and i don't know what created the the bowl in there but there's almost a small bowl on that one property that once you mm -hmm. get into it you get some wetland vegetation and soils but the area between the property and our property is actually a, the first regime is a, a sand, fairly sandy soil. So, yeah. yeah. Paul, I, I do have one question. Mm -hmm. Where this is so you know right up against yeah. the the uh, the fifty foot line, that pool sometimes the the way they're measured now is that the walls of the pool and would coping or something extend yeah we wouldn't have any part of the pool be uh, no, even outside. including the surround and all of that no we'd it, keep that surround up. i mean it, it we'd, would we'd use the, the standard side. format i think they're just going to leave it lawn but if it was a, like typically the patio we're saying mm -hmm. is at this point not structure right but yeah the, that would be the actual outside edge of the foundation of the pool okay that we all would right make, that we would make sure it was it was in that way yeah. So pool cover, no fence. Is that what we're doing? Or is I'm assuming cover? that's probably what they're what they're going to do in here. Is they'll do an auto cover. I'm assuming in that area because they did not ask for any fence. They did not require a fence in there. So. On the equipment, sorry. Equipment's... Equipment would be probably up into the the east side. To what, we'll see where the propane tank is along yeah, that one side, east, okay. or underneath, right underneath the porch area. The porch area is. It's actually just a walk in through the basement and it's just a gravel area, so I'm assuming it would be right underneath that porch area. Yeah, I think I'd prefer it around the side if we could. Yeah. yeah. Any questions from the public? Let's ask a question. Come on up, Edie. Come on up. 
Um, Edie Ray, I'm not sure if Mr. Topham asked this question because it's really hard to hear in this room. Um, but I know that po um, pools are required to have fences. And I'm just wondering if the fencing that's required is going to fall into the resource area. So now there's a code change. If you have an auto cover, you don't need a fence, which is. Say these. that one more time. If you have an auto cover, yeah. Yeah. you don't need the fencing. Need fence. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what everybody's going to That is so thing. scary. Yes. There's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the that's the that's the yeah. official yeah. decision yeah. that auto covers are kind of terrifying. But yeah. It's yeah. wow. what the code building code allows for. Okay, so Paul, you want to continue? Wait, wait. Oh, I think is there anyone else from the public? Okay, my yes. knuckles have been ramped. Re request a continuance. Okay. <laughs> Until um, two five. Yes, February the fifth. Okay. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, Amy M. Ambrecht at thirteen Gingy Lane. Mark Ritz from Site Design, representing the applicants at 13 Genji. Um, this is a property you guys have seen recently for an RDA for a retaining wall. Um, we're back before you with an NOI for a little more extensive site development. Uh, we're proposing a revised retaining wall in the same location where it was previously approved. It's gotten a little bit shorter, a little bit less fill going in behind it. And now we're also proposing a structure, a house, uh, just inside the 100-foot buffer zone, as well as a small uh, fiberglass pool slash spa and some associated uh, patio around that, uh, plus the standard pool equipment, ACs, all that stuff. Um, all proposed structural components will be outside of the 50-foot buffer zone as the entire property is outside. It's about 60, 65 feet from the off-site wetland. Um, nothing, uh, we don't require a groundwater waiver on this property. Uh, groundwater is a bit deeper on this side than it is on the other side of the street. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, uh, the secondary dwelling that's on the plan was already approved under a previous filing. That's made, uh, basically the same structure and the same footprint. We've just got it on here with a corner of the deck just inside the 100 foot. What are your setbacks on this property? Hmm? What are the setbacks on this property? Um, just looking at your AC and pool equipment, it seems like there's going to be a setback. Um, it's a fight you later on, but I'm not sure, honestly. I Sorry, my iPad is like it's pretty close, it's yeah. within 10 Three yard setbacks, five feet. Thank you. Oh. So, what it five says required is five yeah, feet. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to read upside down, and yeah, my iPad is <laughs> yeah, mine's not working with this very well. Yeah, how come where is this? Oh. Good question. Is that the extra horsepower no, iPad? For the record, I will say we did get a file number for this at quarter till four, and it's SE. Oh, excuse me, quarter till five. Quarter, quarter till five. five yes, yeah. it's SE forty-eight thirty-two seventy-three. Eleventh hour file number. Oh. Can I have thirty-two seventy-three? And just uh, for informational purposes, in case people don't remember between our project and the wetland is a fully developed property with a house a pool other right. amenities so we don't feel that anything that's going in you know well outside the 50 is going to have any detrimental impact on the resource as there is similar stuff between us and the resource I, I guess I'll, I'll throw in on this too just to kind of keep everybody up this was the retaining wall through the RDA that was also appealed and I know this question has come up before of whether or not you can apply to alter a structure, or do something, or do more work while you have something in appeal. And that appeal was 
was our decision was upheld through DEP and that was appealed to the um, Office of Dispute Resolution and through that office um, the applicant and the other aggrieved party were able to decide that this filing in this plan was a plan that would satisfy all of their concerns and that this is part of a settlement of, of that going away um, was to get this permitted so we've received a copy of that um, kind of late too and, and a copy of that plan so that appeal will be dropped as long as this goes in so yeah, with the approval of this plan that but appeal will you can't apply for other permits until you have a different permit yeah. appeal yeah. so um, but I wanted to get that on record I know that the other party who appealed the other one sent that stuff into us and wanted to make sure that we understood that that's where they were in the process and, and, and those into there so I wanted to at least get that Interesting. on the record that this revision of this plan um, was essentially what those two parties agreed to as part of that other dispute Thank you. Any further questions from the public? Mark, would you like to close? Yes, we would. Motion closed. Second. All in favor? Aye. <coughs> so moved. Thank you. Okay, on to request for determination. Mid Island Service Limited Partnership. Continued. Oh, that's continued. Excuse me. All right. And so, certificates of compliance. Rock Ganella, trustee of the North Nominee Trust, 73 Easton Street. was for the renovation of an existing structure on a lot and some other site work um, within the flood zone and then just making the 100 foot buffer zone to a bench city wetlands um, that was off site. Um, the work has been completed and is in compliance um, and we're recommending the best certificate be issued without any Motion to issue. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, John J. Miller, 10 Monomoy Creek Road, and you have to the next three together. The next three together. So two, two applications for John J. Miller at 10 Monomoy Creek Road, an application on Monomoy Creek Nominee Trust, 12 Monomoy Creek Road. So from last time, if you guys remember, it was kind of Three separate projects. One involved the removal of a pre existing gabion and retaining wall that was serving as a coastal bank, removing that and naturalizing that coastal bank and revegetating it. The other two projects involved the redevelopment of the two properties at 10 and 12 Monomoy Creek Road. Um, and then on our inspection, that's when we had the issue with the vista cutting that was heard and permitted at the previous meeting for restoration. So with that order in place, I think we feel that I feel we should sign it. With these hmm? yeah, no, sign. You what? can sign that Mark. Okay. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um so we feel that the, these sites now with the orders being expired, the certificates of compliance can be issued on the site for these three orders with the open order for the, the restoration work. Okay. Are there ongoing conditions associated with the CSC? Is or just with the new? All of the, the monitoring conditions got wrapped up into that new one. However, uh, on 12 Monomoy Creek Road, which is the seaward one, we are recommending the monitoring continue on the, the meadow and restoration areas. So we're recommending that conditions 21, 22, 23. 24, 25, and 27 go forward, and that also involves the conditions. For watching this online, you guys did a very good job. Pulling that piece of the fire. Thanks, David. 
Thank you, Joe. <laughs> you don't get a lot of comments about all the things. Really? It was good. Thanks. Uh, Jeff was the uh, hardest one to hear last time. Uh, that was a strange part. Uh, I was I know, short yeah. of microphone, so I was having to use my outside voice the whole time. Motion to approve the certificate of compliance with the ongoing conditions that Jeff listed. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So, um, Alice uh, Rochach at 100 Low Beach Road. Yes. So, this one was an order where we only sold recently heard uh, to deal with the relocation of the shed. Uh, however, this order, 1818, is currently in compliance. We're recommending that it be issued uh, with no ongoing conditions. So. Right. Can I move to issue? Motion to issue with ongoing conditions. No, no, no ongoing, ongoing conditions. conditions. Motion to issue. Good. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, what have I just, what have I done here? Okay, I've managed to lose my my crib sheet. Oh, wait, it's stuck on the back. Uh, why? That's the problem, huh? <laughs> this one? That yes, that's the one. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> He's signing up for these things. sticky thing there. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to get a pass on this one, am I? I got a mighty sire. Okay, we're finished. Uh, so, there are already multiple plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Okay. Uh, Dinah and Alan Schwartz, 62 Westchester Street. All right, so the 62 Westchester Street, this is one that was, if you guys remember, um, was the kind of the after the fact for a pool installation at 62 Westchester Street, uh, where they had to do some restoration work oh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so we've been out there. I, I feel like between Joanne and I, we've probably inspected the site like 10 to 12 times since <laughs> this has kind of gone forward. It's been out there, I feel like, a lot. Um, but it's done. Everything is in. All of the planting and restoring areas are in. All of the Permanent markers are installed, um, and we really feel like the, the site kind of came together and came into compliance. That being said, uh, we're recommending that this certificate be issued, but with ongoing conditions. Um, and I'll run through really quickly. 19, which is for the lighting to be directed away from the resource area. 22, uh, which is just that the plantings within the resort areas must be. Um, native species with no cultivars in case they have to replace any. Uh, 26, 27, and 28 uh, are our kind of standard pool conditions for time of year chemical treatment and training. Uh, 29 is that any invasive species found within that restoration area shall be treated promptly and removed after they by a protocol with staff for, for how they're going to be doing it. Uh, and then 30 is the requirement for those permanent markers. Stay in place. So uh, we're recommending that gets issued with those ongoing issues. Okay. Most issue with uh, ongoing issues number 19, 22, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Just show them. Yeah. yeah. Smoking. This is a meeting. <laughs> <Jeez. Yeah. laughs> Second. Thank you. All in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 That was you must have gone to the health plan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, make, it really work, <laughs> make it work for it. So orders of conditions. Sorry. Well, the one that I had drafted was for seven king back there, and it seems like I forgot to put it on. So oh. I get back to okay. All right. So, so we're going to be doing three and four. We're, we're doing seven. Washington Street extension, right? Yes. Yeah, we, Anyone so. have any thoughts on that? Uh, not really. that I had listed on there. Uh, 
were our, our typical photo monitoring of that path that was going to be abandoned, um, and that that vegetation within the area be maintained at a 75% survival or greater, and then that all planted vegetation has to be native species to build cultivars. They're putting a little cluster of plantings at the end of the existing path to keep people from going back up it to let it eat vegetation. Mm -hmm. Other than that, yep. Or a set of is that beach grass? Or no, they, no, they mentioned was, arrowwood. It was yeah. arrowwood. Yeah. Oh. It's a it's good to have that condition in there because arrowwood has quite a few pretty popular cultivars. Yes, yeah, quite you know, a. If you go to any nursery, you find viburnum dentatum, and you'll see the X. Autumn jazz, There's, blue blue muffin, ephemeral sunset. They're really yeah. catchy names, so but <laughs> but we don't want any of those. We just want viburnum dentatum. That's it. In there. So the only conditions that we have for that one. Okay. And Cherry Street's continued, but. Oh, do you guys want to take a vote oh. on that one? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, would anybody like to move to approve? We're talking about Baxter Road right now? Yeah. yeah. Motion approved. As amended or uh, did we amend it? No, we didn't amend it. No, okay. Excuse me. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, sir. I didn't draft the other two because, like I said, we didn't have problems. Well, Gingy Lane, we just have the pool requirements. Right. Standard, standard pool stuff. Standard pool stuff. Yep. Same for Cherry Street. Are there any other concerns for Cherry Street? Why was it? Was that continued? Cherry was continued just for the lack of Because uh, no right. DEP yeah. yeah. number. Do you guys have like a word for next time we can serve the DEP? Sure. Start to draft projections. Yeah. So, uh, extension of orders of conditions for Pocomo Point Realty Trust, 90 Pocomo Road. Sure, so we have an extension request in. All the polls are up Okay, let's try it again. Uh-huh. Thank you. For the record, Paul Santos with the Nantucket Surveyors. This is a requ request for an extension of two years to the order of conditions for 90 Pocomo Road. Um, many of you know it. It's the Gamble property. So uh, you, many have seen what's gone on down there, but the house was picked up. It was moved, and they're uh, working their way um, through. So the work has started. Um, we're just looking for a two-year extension to, um, to complete the project. Is, is the house down on the foundation? Yes, yet? it is. It's down and graded around, and yes. So we did. I did take a look at it, and it is a site that it is in compliance for the stage of construction that it's in. So obviously, it's not in its final condition. Yeah. We did check. So DP numbers hanging up. Sometimes it's are still in. No. Yeah, it's a good clean site actually. Yeah. The time I put down there. that bank. <laughs> yeah. As a 12 year old. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> the red light's still on. You know what I mean? You're like, he ain't running down the block of the Just as a formality here, is it two one year extensions that we do, or can we just do a two year extension? They requested two one, one year extensions. Two one year extensions. Yeah. We unfortunately have to grant one year at a time. Yeah, that's what grant up to three one year extensions to do it. The course of that. Yep. Motion and order. Two one year extensions. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So moved. Thank you. Second to last. All right. Other business. Uh, approval of minutes. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, they look good. Thanks. Doing a great job. Yeah, she even has been doing the always. last couple like, by watching the video. Yeah. They're solid minutes, though. Yeah. 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 She's still good. Here. She does an excellent job. So. Yeah, actually, right. turn on the closed caption. <laughs> No, I actually, I was like, yeah. this actually works really well. Oh, does it? Does yeah. it? Yeah. You're closed kidding. Captions. No, you can do closed caption on YouTube. Yeah, Whoa. it's pretty cool. Oh, I didn't know that. But, yeah, I didn't know that. Well, I had on my big screen TV. I was so... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had a class. Well, motion to approve. <laughs> <laughs> <was like>, this <laughs> is a way to watch a movie. That makes it <laughs> much more palatable. Maybe it's sick more often. <laughs> Damn, I'm going to have to start yeah. wearing makeup. What can I say? The mics are still on there, Joe. So. That's okay. <laughs> motion to approve the minutes by unanimous consent. Second. Second. Okay. So approved. Monitoring reports? We don't have any in this time. Okay. 
continue discussion for SBPF. I think I'll, I'll, I'll if it's all right with you, I'll kind of tee this up a little bit. Okay. Kind of leave off. I know, especially because Joe and Mark were not here last time. I think by this time, two weeks ago, though, I think Mark had officially been named onto the commission, though. So he was, he was in. So um, just to kind of leave off to the two, and then I think we'll probably get to the to number 28 seconds. So we had carried forward the SE 48 2824 nourishment material and sand sampling protocol on per chance that they were to receive their soil testing results back and had provided it to us prior to this meeting if things had gone uh, speedier than they had anticipated. So uh, to this point, we haven't received those testing results yet, and I know we have been kind of eyeballing the 2-5 meeting to have that discussion as well. Um, so I think we would recommend carrying it forward again. If people have other comments, they can certainly provide those now. Um, but again, I think we were waiting for those soil testing results and the chemical and biological analysis of that material to come back to kind of inform that discussion further. Hopefully that captures it for the members who missed a little bit. I could probably talk to Mark about 30 hours about this if I really, you know. Really I got a bunch of photographs from somewhere of all the bricks, plastic, they were on different sure. days, yeah. different days. What was, what was that? Sure, so one of the things that they've been providing to us on a uh, regular basis, the commission has asked for daily logs of their required daily inspections of that structure. And one of the things that the permit holder is required to provide is a documentation of the man-made materials removed that have been spread throughout. So we get daily pictures of, Boy. they've been using kind of a five gallon bucket to quantify the stuff they've been picking up of, of bricks or pieces of pipe or wire or things that have come out. And they um, have been sending those to us pretty regular to account for their daily logs. I believe the only couple days they've missed are, I know they didn't do Christmas and a couple Sundays that they weren't out there, but I kind of understand you. no one going out on Christmas, but um, they've been, yeah. they have been keeping up and providing, providing that requested information. So just one comment or question about the daily logs. There had been an issue with the log from the 21st of December and the 24th of December showing the same photo and information. And it's been switched out, but the it's now saying that the inspector on the 24th was someone completely different. It wasn't Jamie. It wasn't Jamie. It's saying Joe yeah, Gutino. There's a couple. There's like three different people doing the and, inspections. And um, it would just would have been nice to have them here to make sure that that sure we can actually happen to, to confirm that correctly. Yeah. Sure. Um, because he he had originally said that he, or at least I had thought that he had said that he had done the survey both days, but I and, know and I, he did say that, and, and he had put both pictures in. Yeah, the queue, so. I, I know it's hard to remember every single time you're at a survey, but just making sure that that's actually the person who did the survey that day. No, nope, we can get that confirmed for sure. And um, what's the Remind me what's happening on the underwater survey again. Uh, we'll get to that as part of number 28. But um, I just want to make sure if there's, you might see if there's any public comment on the sand portion first. I, yeah, I have one other thing. So we had also requested um, weekly photos of the extent of the geotubes that have become uncovered. And I know in the last packet of daily inspection logs, there are some photos but they're lumped lumped into the cleanup. And we had requested separate um, photos weekly of the extent sure. of the geo tube. Yeah. I can just ask you to separate that. Yeah. Go for it. And it, to show the yeah, whole yeah. extent of the template, not just the one section that they survey them. Just, just to, yeah, just to avoid confusion. Okay. Um, the, the other thing I was wondering, having gone through there, you know, most days there's a, around a gallon worth of, of bricks and then there's days where there's you know substantially more are we um, in terms of looking at uh, you know like the totals I mean you know it's day by day it's very important to have but then when we look step back and look after a month how many how many gallons have you know 
um, um, eroded out of the the bluff above that are are you know potentially um, or I mean of the that we that uh, you know what I'm trying to say. How you're many looking for of, of, that just a daily quantity, but then you're looking for a total quantity at some point as well. Right, and see, and what you know, what does that look like then? So we'll have you know so many gallons of bricks. If you just look at it one at a time, it may not seem so much. The stockpiling. Yeah. yeah. No, are they? they? Yeah. yeah. They, oh, they're, oh, they're, I they're keeping it all. We can yeah, we can yeah. get a total and then. Oh, okay. No, I didn't realize. I didn't realize. Also of course, that makes sense. Yeah. And I'll, I'll send an email out and we'll put something up online that that has where that stuff is yeah okay, good. it was my understanding that if we wanted to actually view that we we could it would be accessible to us yeah i'll get that location oh, that would be great i would like to i'd like to, I'd like there to are see other that questions if anyone else wants to go see it they can go see it too yeah thank I you i don't think it's i know the commission specifically asked for it to be available for viewing so it should be available for viewing any uh public comment on this all right, so. Ah, Edie. Sorry. Fresh use of the audience. Yes. Sneaky that Edie. Oh, yeah. um, Edie Ray, um, I, I think I heard that they haven't, you haven't gotten the results of the tests that you asked for, but my question is have they conducted the tests? So is the stuff already in the bag? You just haven't heard it yet? Because my concern would be is if they haven't already taken the samples, we've had all these storms and lots of rain and there's more coming, so stuff might wash away or be diluted or God knows what. No, they've so taken I'm, the samples. Sure. So, so they have taken yeah, the samples. They have. Yeah, so two weeks ago uh, at the last commission meeting on the 8th, I'm going to do my quick math, they completed their sampling on January 6th, 7th, and 8th of the entire area requested and have sent that off for processing and they're just awaiting for that testing results from their third-party vendor to to come back to them on the I guess the then test. a follow-up to that would be now that all this time has passed if you guys are requesting more information and more sampling what I just said earlier would apply that would be my concern I, I can respond to that so sorry we are um, requesting the um, SPPF have the lab also retain the material that they have already collected so if there are additional parameters that we want tested that have not yet been tested for we don't need to take a new discrete sample that might have already been you know um, eroded or washed into the ocean we can actually test the sand that has already been collected great thank you very much Okay, go to it. All right, so special condition 28. So after um, doing some looking in and, and going forward, um, we can have a little bit of a discussion about it. But I think if we reference back to um, the letter that Dwight provided us, sorry, I printed it out for myself, back from November 15th when we were originally talking about their missed reports and when we made a finding on November 6th that they had met some of the failure criteria um, in regards to missed quarterly reports from the Woods Hole Group, which we went through. At that following meeting when we had the information, um, we probably should have addressed this then because it would have made the best sense in time. I think everyone was a little confused in the, the breadth of reports. But in that same time when they missed those quarterly surveys in that survey window. The other two surveys that the Woods Hole Group have been doing for them, one was the bathymetric survey and one was the other underwater video survey from the spring of the same year when they missed the quarterly reports. Those were also not completed and we should have also issued out, probably in that same enforcement would have been the most convenient time to do it, but now we should have also probably or we would have recommended issuing out an enforcement also acknowledging that they failed to meet special condition 28 that required those surveys as well because mm -hmm. that was the time window that they missed them in so I apologize for the confusing and the confusion in that and I, I thank for um, Deanne and the Coastal Conservancy for um, having us look at that again because that was something that 
in all of the reports that we're sifting through missed that those two reports had also um, been missed in that survey window. So I guess we would recommend that an enforcement go out that they also failed to meet that condition 28 in the, the spring of, of 2019 when they missed those quarterly surveys. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Kind of, sort of? Yes, yeah, so there's a there's comment. Yeah. Evening. Jay Maroney with uh, Cohen Cohen for the applicant or I'm sorry, what's the name? Maroney, Jay Maroney. Um, we have no problem with what Joe's discussed and, and spoken with. The only thing that we'd ask is that it be combined and just in an amended EO from the original one so it doesn't look like you're issuing another enforcement action that's separate as if it were new, a new issue. So we don't think it's fair that we would get dinged again because it wasn't included in the original enforcement action. So we'd like to have the enforcement action that was previously issued just amended to add this since we mentioned that we, in the letter on the 15th of uh, November 19, we you know, admit to the three errors. Um, we agree that that would be subject to an enforcement action that that's perfectly uh, correct. Uh, but we just ask that it not be issued as a new enforcement action looking like we have a continued violation. We think that's sort of a ex little extra punitive. So, and so I understand what you're saying. I'm just not sure if we have the ability so to actually amend I looked into this because we don't really have the ability to issue out an amended enforcement. There's not necessarily a process to do that. So I think the way we did it and kind of puzzled out the language of that is under number two on the enforcement order, there's an extent and type of activity. Um, and we had typed out this kind of a draft here that says, in conjunction with the enforcement issued on 11-20-2019 related to missed reporting requirements, additional condition 28 should have been included in the missed reporting. The commission finds that at the time of the original enforcement was issued that this condition was also not in compliance. So it's something that it summarizes that that's when we should have done it. Um, because that's when we determined it wasn't, uh, mm -hmm. but also lumps this together. So the conditions for that went out on the eleven twenty one would still hold on this one. If you want, uh, again, so if you want to get that clarified better, or or have George available to talk about that too, uh, I think we can all agree that. We know that condition 28 was missed, and everyone fully understands that. If we want to try to clean that up better, um, I don't think that issuing this out today, <coughs> time wise, is critical as long as we issue it out ultimately to acknowledge that that condition was missed. I think we need it. George's kind yes, of says, okay. Yeah, although I have to say, um, as a lawyer, I thought you did pretty well with that drafting. <laughs> I, I sadly have a lot of practice in this time of my life of writing <laughs> sentences that sound like lawyers wrote them. So, um, but if you guys would like to do that, I'd also say if there's any public comment, you may take that too. But um, yes. we do recommend that it does need to get clarified and, and actually issued out at some point. Right. So, I think we can take public comment, but just for the process, I'm happy to have George's counsel, um, you know, review this obviously. But tonight, do we have to find that condition twenty or twenty eight? Sure. If you guys wanted to make a finding that says condition it, okay. twenty eight wasn't met um, based upon the, you know, the memo issued to you in November, I think that would be be fine. Okay. Was right. that already found out that? that no, it was not. No, they had to formally do it. Discussion of the quarterly reports. Yeah, I, I think we need, I personally think we need to say that we find that special condition 28 has been not in yeah. compliance or not, not met. Yeah. And then we'll get George to help us work some of that together. Okay, I'm a bit baffled why you feel separating them is more punitive as opposed to just being descriptive. What am I missing here? It, it looks like a second a of series of violations that were, were a continuing bad actor, that we've done something wrong again. So that someone could say they missed something here, and then they didn't clean up their act, and they kept missing things. So rather than the fact that it was one 
time period of error, that it looks like a recurring period of errors. And have you provided that uh, survey, underwater survey? Uh, this, the next surveys that were due are done are being done and are on time. We are now in the bathymetric and underwater surveys of the fall winter series have physically been completed. Yes. Oh, okay. We are just awaiting. So we have that report. Okay. Back. And we are also okay. eagerly anticipating the annual report that is also due that is coming soon too. Okay. So is the DEP aware of this? I don't want to say third finding, but yes. Well, it is. I mean, it is a, a third finding, but it just—it's not new. Yeah, I understand right. what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And yes. we. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to make it clear. We're going to make it clear that so this we, is some new thing. So we've been trying to forward all the information that we get to DEP, <clears throat> whether it's public information or or whatever. We just kind of conduited them to them as well, and they know they can pull our stuff off of our web page and things like that for any review. Yeah, just any make sure we're checking any enforcements or proceedings yeah. or things, we, we always send it off to the regional office. Sure. And that's true for really any project. I don't want to make it sound like okay. it's oh, just sorry. this one. Any project that we get, they get copies of filings and then supplemental information, but then as things come in or any enforcement or informational gathering or those things, if it rises to this level, they get all of that information as well. Not just for the Geo2 project, but for the point or for anywhere else. Okay, so uh, thank you, Jay. Thanks, sir. And um, any public comment on this? Hi, Deanne. Long evening. Deanne Atherton, Nantucket Coastal Conservancy. Thank you for putting this on the agenda. Um, I couldn't hear everything. I just, I wanted to point out a couple things. My recollection is that the reason you didn't find a failure with Special Condition 28 when you did with Special Condition 27 was that information was provided to you by Mr. Dunk that they were related, and it sounded like that they were the same thing. Now, I can go back and find that in the letter. Um, and in fact, we raised that issue then and said, you know, is this the same thing? <coughs> and in our letter of December 3rd, and it's it's in a packet that's so long <laughs> that I made hard copies for you because I don't know, you know, if you got to this letter. But we pointed it out in this letter, December 3rd. <laughs> Maybe you have it set. I'm Thank not you. sure. Yeah, we do. Um, Thank you. to come in on now, but um, I guess it was Mr. Duncan in his letter of November 15 was listing the, um, the reports that they were not current on, and he said something to the effect, and I don't have the exact quote, that they're related, so they're sort of considered as one. The point is that they are not related. They are totally separate. And on the third page of this letter is the text of Special Condition 27, which relates to the quarterly reports, and then Special Condition 28, which um, relates to the underwater video, which is, has a different time frame. It's semi-annual, it's spring and fall. It's done by a different consultant. Um, a member of the community brought to our attention that um, they were in arrears on this, and one of our team members, Burton Balkind, mentioned this at public comment and I can go back and I can cite that. Um, the important thing with the, 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 the monitoring reports and the submission of the monitoring reports, that failure to meet the monitoring requirements 
will constitute a failure. And that's in Special Condition 34, which is on page 4. So we feel for the record to be complete and to reflect what actually happened, that you need to take, we would request that you take formal action to find that they did not meet the requirements of Special Condition 28, which in effect was a failure criteria and warrants an enforcement action. And that is separate from the quarterly reports. And it more actual, accurately reflects, for the record, what happened. So I, Any questions on that? I think Deanne and I uh, agreed in different description. I think our recommendation is that you guys make a finding that they they did not meet special condition 28 for the spring 2019 surveys. And then, obviously, failure to meet those reporting requirements obviously falls within that same failure criteria of not meeting that. So I think we're essentially recommending that you guys find that they didn't meet special condition 28. In its entirety? Is that, I mean, well, I they, they did not meet I'm special not condition 28 is. for the spring survey window right. of 2019. Right. Correct. Right. Now, also, what is the current condition? Are they up to date? We had difficulty finding these documents online. So they, they have completed the physical survey for the fall 2019 window. We have verify that the, the videoing was complete and they are supposed to be issuing us those reports. Okay. Well, in special condition 28, it says that the report will be submitted 30 days after the completion of the survey. Now, I, we assume completion of the survey means when they're out there in the Althea K taking the underwater. Um, plates and that it said sh the data and analysis shall be submitted to the department and the conservation NCC within 30 days of completion of the survey. So we'll, we will confirm that date for you and if they are outside that date you guys can take that up as a as a point on that that order for when they completed that fall okay. survey. I just don't have that date off the top of my head. You know, it gets a little technical. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Dean. Thank you. I do think, for the record, it's important that we find that only Special Condition 28 was not met. If you look at what's in Special Condition 34B, that's what we found before. Failure to conduct shoreline monitoring and post-storm monitoring is required herein. This is different. This is bathymetric offshore underwater video video monitoring so to be complete and not confusing what we found previously for special condition 27 related to special condition 34 but i think in this case we just need to find that only special condition 28 has not been met because 34 only relates to 27 not to 28. so well, if you guys make the finding that 28 wasn't met, we will get draft language similar to what we did with the previous two for you guys to review with the 2-5 meeting, and then you can sign and issue that. Okay. okay. That will get us started to get that cleaned up and rectified and hopefully get us caught up to date with the first round of these. So would you like to make a formal motion that condition 28 was not met? In yes. The spring of 2019. I move to find that special condition 28 has not been met for the spring of 2019 related to the bathymetric and underwater video survey. A second. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. 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 So that's uh, five ayes, one abstention. Okay. All right, moving on, uh, reports. Uh, Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee. 
So, um, in a nutshell, it turns out that the uh, the original committee was formed with the expectation that there was a draft coastal resiliency plan would already have been received before the committee started work, and it hadn't been, or more importantly, it had been received and rejected by the town, and so... It had been received and rejected yes. by the town? Is this like back in April? Uh, I don't know the exact date. Do you know no. the exact date? I think um, it was... Oh. The first rough draft of the Coastal Resiliency Strategies document, as we now call it, was received the same day as the... Uh, Nantucket Coastal Conference. So whatever day that was, was the first time that anyone in the town saw a uh, pretty rough draft of what was finally finalized um, about a week ago. From it was in June, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, there we were not realizing that really, you know, not that we had nothing to do, but we were discussing the new RFP with um, Vince Murphy, who is the coordinator, without really realizing what we were up to. So uh, we've been using the Malone and McBroom report to give added input into to Vince, who is responsible for drafting the new RFP. And, uh, and so it goes. But so back to square one and a half, so to speak. So just just so I'm clear, because because I, I remember all this, and that was supposed to have been done, you know, back in April, and then right. it was May, and so so actually something came in in May or June, and the town said this isn't good or right. We, it was complete boilerplate. It really didn't apparently. Well, from, that I is that is it. unfortunately what their other reports they've done uh, have been of a similar ilk. Um, but so now we have something from them, right. which are we it, it, are we going to use it? When I say we, the town, I mean, are we going to use that to only to help? In as much. My understanding is only as much as it conditions um, uh, the committee's input into the new RFP that is going to be going out shortly for uh, bidding for a coastal resiliency plan. And it's apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, the Malone and McBroom were paid 25000 for theirs, I believe, and 300000 has been allocated for the new um, coastal resiliency plan from uh, it's going out to bid. Is, am I correct there? So Malone and McBroom's original contract was for twenty five. Yeah. I don't know if that was the final that was a okay. project that Chuck Larson was managing. Right. So yeah. I don't know if after the original report came in, um and didn't meet all of the right specifications that, that we thought it was going to, if that's the number that was sent to them. I don't know. Um That was the number that I heard. But, but I don't know that was the original the original yeah. agreed amount. So um but from there, I know there's been other money allocated to develop that plan, hopefully correctly. So that's the state of play. But you guys didn't see the report or anything? Yes, well, we just got it just, you know, like a few hours before we met the other day. And we're, and we're using it. We're meeting next week and using that to um, help us on making suggestions to Vince, okay. who is the one who's ultimately responsible for drafting the, or drafting his part of the RFP with our input. Is that so. that draft, you know, whatever it is that you got last week, is that? Um, That's their final report. So their final, is that is that available to the public now? I would I believe yeah. it is. Ah, okay. I can I can send around the link, or I can send around the report to them. Yeah, no, I yeah, would, I would it'd be, be very, good very, link, I think, very interested. Sure. It is interesting, and um, and it's also got some a lot of ancillary websites on the different <coughs> subjects that is oh, very sure. interesting. Thank you. So, well, oh, good. Um, all right, uh, CPC. So just to bring Mark up to speed, so we've taken all the money, we've allocated it to certain projects, and turned down unfortunately a couple of projects, but. Um, 
we've just met and had a couple little projects still moving forward. So uh, we haven't really issued a, what, with, what, when, where yet, but that's coming out soon. Um, NP and EDC? Uh, we haven't met uh, yet. It's We meet uh, Thursday. Oh. So our next meeting, I'll have a report. And Ashley isn't here for, is Mosquito Control Committee no, def defunct, probably, in fact? Uh, so yeah. 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 We, we might take that off, the list. List. Yeah. Okay. Okay. that off the list. So, Commissioner's comments? So I just want to bring up the 41 and 43. I know they're not before us, but um, the one thing I've been noticing is that the car wash, it seems like there's more <clears> suicides <throat> than ever coming down into so, the and Sparks Avenue. Right. So yeah. 41 and yeah. 43 Sparks Avenue. Uh, amazingly enough, they actually filed an application. Uh, and if anyone's looked at the information that you guys got for a kind of a collection system at the end of their driveway uh, with some treatment and some infiltration, they amazingly filed it before they had a couple incidents that have since been reported to DEP as far as a. Uh, chemical spill as it was reported at the time it was some of their I, I apologize that was away but it was some of their red soap whichever their red soap is but I know it, it ultimately kind of culminated in the fire chief and going and collecting the uh, material and hazard data sheet for the forum and figuring out what it is and then getting sent <coughs> up to the DEP strike team such a great name for a couple of guys that just run around and Tell people how to clean up a mess. Come on. Um, but it, but it, Come it's on. Cut him some slack. Get a badge. Drive around in a big van. No, I like, surely do. I will say, though, so, the two guys that, that I know that are on that team, uh, they're crazy. And Former they do Navy an amazing seals. job. They're unbelievable. Like when we had the <coughs> issue down in Easy Street with the uh, fuel system, tank from the gas, yeah. um, I'm just blanking on the name now. It's beneath Charlie Noble, the old yep. abandoned one that yep. was there. Mm -hmm. and they sent out the one guy. And he had that place like locked down in like five minutes. It was, un and he was like crawling through pipes. Like, he's an intense guy. Um, super nice though. Um, so they reported to them. They reviewed it. They re they reviewed it for volume. They reviewed it for concerns. Um, they had the car wash company send off some samples to them to be tested, um, to go through it from there. And they've been kind of working with the car wash to deal with it. Um, also knowing that the car wash is also in the process of installing hopefully a system to prevent these issues from going forward. <coughs> so um, it has been a very active site for a few weeks and excuse me, Public Works has had some concerns about where the siting for some of the components were going as far as going in the public road layout, thinking yeah. that it should be all contained on the private property and there's been a little bit of back and forth and that's primarily why it's been continue okay. uh, but uh, like I said they've been leaving all of the spill issues to the specials at DEP to, to deal with that so we've been really happy to let them deal with it. Yeah I wanted to bring up last meeting but, yeah, it, was but it was uh, it was concerning yeah so, you know so so yeah there were a couple incidents that that happened that would really uh, raise the eye of everyone pretty quickly and I'll give credit where credit's due. The first one was actually reported and found um, by Mo out of the DPW. Is he was in the area and said some just happened to be by and knew what to do, and that's kind of what kicked it off. But they had already filed with us, so they clearly knew that there was an issue yeah. in advance, and then they, they had some issues. So um, hopefully that will be resolved relatively soon. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, uh, any staff reports? Wait, I, I have a, one comment, oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. <laughs> so, just one additional piece of business related to SPPF. We had, uh, or I had requested at one point, a uh, more in-depth discussion of the um, unmanned aerial system, or unmanned aircraft um, service that they've undergone. Oh right. Well, this is the drone the survey. Drone, and the drone the, surveys and, and their standards or whatever that they apply. The yes, the please. I don't know if it's, uh, in your opinion, prudent to do it as a separate agenda item or as part of the review for when the annual um, survey or the annual report comes out. <coughs> So you, one of your concerns was, uh, correct if I'm wrong, 
This is from Mark in part. Is that the software was unreadable or was no software? No, you, no there's no. there's essentially a, an issue where in subsequent years, it's now been ameliorated in the last two surveys, but in subsequent years, starting in 2016, 2017, data was collected using two different two different um, controls. No, two different. Um, surveying uh, strategies. The first was aerial, aerial photogrammetry and the second was LIDAR. And there's an issue with those two um, types of mapping don't display data in the same format. LIDAR displays uh, a digital terrain model and aerial orthogrammetry displays a, a bare earth model so that the vegetation and any um, structures aren't included. So the data is not comparable between the two surveys. Um, there's also a question of the 1990 something. I forget what the date is of this point. At why this don't, point, but why don't we make this a, yeah. a separate item? Separate item, but yeah, we can compile. It. We'll work to compile all of that together. Yeah, and sure. Get it out to everybody and try to get those questions answered. Just just some some issues about the the types of collection that they've been doing not matching each other to make sure that the data will, the data is comparable over year to year. But yeah, separate agenda item would be good, I guess. Sure. Okay. So any further commissioner's comments or the staff reports? Yeah, so one of them is just, uh, because we forgot to bring it last time, is if you guys remember, we did an emergency authorization for moving 29 sheep on road, mm -hmm. and we needed you guys to to ratify and sign that. You guys ratified it and I forgot to bring it to sign, so I brought it for you guys to sign. Uh, so I believe the four of you that were here last time are the four of you across the front. Yeah, oh, I wasn't here. Oh, I, I missed that. So Ashley if, was here. If Ian, Dave, and Seth sign it, I'll track down Ashley yeah. and sign it. So um, and we need to date this too? Nope. Oh, I already okay. dated it. You can right. sign it. And Excellent. It's already in process and they're doing it, but uh, we just have to ratify it. Okay. Nicely and clean. Um, other than that, the one thing I was going to add, um, I don't think it's any secret to anyone in the room. Um, we've been informed by DEP to expect the decision on the Wisconsin Bluff appeal. Joe, you were um, there, were you? No, just no, put no. it on the file. Oh, well, it just goes on the so, file. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. If you want to replace odds, I'm happy to keep your money. Well, we, we have been we have been informed by DEP that they'll be issuing out um, the superseding order on the Wisconsin Bluff project. Um, I don't know if it's a decision to affirm our decision or to overturn our decision, uh, but they've been telling us now it's going to be out today. It's going to be out today. It's going to be out today for like the last like four days in a row. So they told us it's going to be out today, um, and as of it's about 7.45 the last time I looked and we hadn't received it. So I'm anticipating um, hopefully tomorrow, the next day. So that being said, um, I know people had asked, the select board had had an executive session discussion tomorrow that is no longer happening. So um, we'll wait and see. But as soon as we have it, I promise I'll email it out for everybody to, yeah. to read and review. Um, the one thing I was going to ask, I know it's not necessarily a posted agenda item, so you guys don't have to decide. Kind of tacitly nod. I am assuming that regardless of whatever that decision is, you guys would probably like to discuss it probably prior to our next meeting. So that would and, be and with probably, George. probably setting up an executive session of some kind to do that. So we'll contact you guys all to schedule that, and that's something that we can do kind of outside the open meeting law parameters, but <clears throat> we discussed that in advance like months ago that if it was gonna come out, we wanted to have that session with George. Um, he and I have been kind of waiting and kind of waiting. There's some time frames involved. Obviously, if the commission decides to appeal a decision, there's a window to, to make that appeal in, so we'd have to have that discussion sooner than later. So, well, so I know that's a lot to take in for your first point. Yes. Meeting Mark, but if you no, want to talk no, I, about I, I got it. that process more, we can. And just on the other side of that, the appeal based on the local regulations in the Superior Court, what's going on? Yeah. It has been filed, and we, I believe, have responded with the administrative records of it. It's a matter of waiting for the schedule when the first one is off. 
discussion will be or, or, or whenever it is kind of in the court's hands. So. Oh, I know. It's, it can take a so while. You know, it's my, it's uh, 8 o'clock in the evening. I, shall we move to adjourn? So moves. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Good night. Don't close the meeting. Don't. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Stay here all night. You, you, you inspired me. I, 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 so yeah. I just missed you guys so much. I figured I'd stay longer. <laughs> oh, okay. Because you watched well, the last meeting so, in so, 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 I didn't need to do. Yeah, my Yeah, apparently. Oh, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's much more. That's sound, that sounds like a, like so, a nice so, time. Well, one thing you can do once you see it, uh, you know.